My name is Deborah Summerfield, and on behalf of the Lake County Wine Grape Commission, I would like to welcome you all to Momentum 2023. Uh, we have a terrific lineup of speakers today, covering topics from market trends to our volcanic region, uh, to a showcase of the Commission's exciting new program, Lake County Pruning School. During today's break, please be sure to head to the lobby and interact and mingle with our sponsors. Uh, they are here to engage with you, and their support makes events like this possible. Uh, and in fact, there's actually one of the sponsors out there has a package, a drawing for a package of Giants tickets. So please uh, head out there. Uh, then after the session today, uh, we'll cap off the afternoon with a selection of Lake County wines, tasty hors d'oeuvres by Rosie Cooks, and music by Austin and Owens. It's really great to see so many familiar faces and several new faces too. Uh, we encourage you to stick around, eat, drink, and mingle. Now, for just a bit of housekeeping for those who haven't been here before or it's been a long time, restrooms are out in the lobby, and we'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phones. Uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions of each speaker at the end of their pre presentation, so keep that in mind. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our MC for the afternoon. Please join me in welcoming General Manager of Brassfield Estate, Proprietor of Walters Vineyard, and Chair of the Lake County Wine Grape Commission, Jonathan Walters. Howdy, everybody. Thank you, Deborah. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Deborah said, my name is Jonathan Walters. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming out today and uh, participating in the event. Uh, I want to take a minute and actually thank Deborah. This is actually Deborah's 10th year working with the Wine Grape Commission, so thank you very much. All right. Uh, I'll get started now. So let me kind of give you a, a, a what's going to be happening today. So uh, Christian Clear is here from Turrentine. He's going to give us kind of a sense of the current state of the industry um, and recent grape bulk trends and grape sales. Uh, then a research team from the USGS will give you a sneak peek of what they've been researching uh, and, and analyzing in the volcanic characteristics of our region. After that, we'll take a quick little break. Uh, we'll showcase the Lake County Pruning School featuring a presentation by world-renowned vine master pruners from Simonette and Cirque. A panel discussion of growers who attended the event uh, will take place after that. And a demonstration from our partners in Felco with the wonderful products that they are offering. Uh, as Deborah said, each present, uh, everybody presenting, uh, presenting today will be, uh, have, has been asked to take, uh, answer questions from you guys. So feel free to answer, uh, ask a question once the presentation is over. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and start with our first presenter, Christian Clear. Christian comes from a multi-generation multi pair farming background here in Lake County. He began his farming career at the age of four of driving a tractor, don't tell OSHA, Christian, with his father and his grandfather setting smudge pots uh, during frost season. While in high school, I did ask this, in high school, he managed multiple small pair packing sheds during the summer with his friends, and he also earned a degree in viticulture and tree fruits from Fresno State, Christian worked with the Welch Vineyard Management Company in, in Mendocino County, where he eventually became Director of Vineyard Operations in Lake County, overseeing 1,500 acres. Uh, from there, Christian went on to work with Shannon Ranches as the winery relation and viticulturalist, and eventually the Vice President overseeing farming operations of about 4,500 acres in six counties. Today, Christian works with Turn Time Broker as their North Coast Grape Broker. He is here today to share data uh, and latest insights uh, with the current state of the wine grape in, uh, industry. Please um, join me in welcoming Christian. Clear. What a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, sorry about the long intro about there. I, I see a lot of fam familiar faces in the crowd today. Appreciate you having me today. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, grape industry and uh, let's get started. So. Um, a lot of these graphs are numbers that we track within Turrentine, and um, first off, I like to say, a Lake County born and raised person, fourth generation, glad to be here, glad to be representing Lake County in the brokerage world. I'm not sure if anyone in the brokerage world has ever uh, came out of Lake County, and if they have, I don't know who they are. So I um, want to say that I'm here to represent the North Coast, Lake and Mendocino County, more so than any other brokers have in the past, so um, glad to be here, glad to be talking to you all. Um, as most of you know, Sauvignon Blanc has been a very hot varietal and a very popular varietal here in Lake County. Um, so the, 
good news there is uh, the market is strong. We still have a lot of active buyers, and uh, the price is, is the best we've seen in the history of Lake County for Sauvignon Blanc. Um, consumers seem to be gravitating towards that varietal, and uh, we're seeing it not only in uh, consumption, uh, but also in great purchasing, uh, the reflection of that, which is all positive. I wish I could say the same about red grapes in the North Coast. Um, last year seemed to be uh, pretty strong. We had a lot of activity in the year before coming uh, through the pandemic, but um, this year it's been a lot quieter. So, and we think that has a lot to do with the reflection of um, the uh, interior valley. So in my experience here in the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of interior valleys come over to Lake and Mendocino County to buy uh, fruit, especially Cabernet, to make their valley programs better. Since, since, um, since the report has came out this year that uh, we've seen a downturn in the, uh, the lower bottom tier uh, price point, 599 and below, a 6% drop in uh, that category, which is the largest drop in that category since its inception. So um, those wineries that would come over here and pick up large tonnage, 1,000 tons, uh, 500 tons at a time have not been active in the market and that what we used uh, we use that activity as leverage to the smaller north coast uh, uh, wineries that would come up and buy their out of Appalachian fruit from us too so we don't currently have that dynamic happening in the industry right now and so the uh, the the other small wineries who are looking for a truckload or two truckloads or three truckloads have not uh, had that competition in the market to drive that price. So we are seeing a depressed uh, market in regards to uh, Cabernet, specifically Zinfandel seems to be following that channel as well. Okay, here we go. So back to the beginning. Um, most of you have probably seen the Turrentine uh, wheel. Uh, some people call it the wheel of fortune. Some people call it the wheel of torture. Um, <laughs> it can be both. Uh, so we'll talk about what slows down the wheel. Um, and so we see flat case sales, uh, that slows the wheel down. Some wineries long on case goods in bulk and grapes, that will slow the wheel down. And uh, grapes being planted in the North Coast or overplanted in all regions can slow that wheel down. And this is what speeds the, the wheel up. So removal of acres, um, shorter contract lengths, um, resurgent in retail sales, just in time inventory, and buyers buyers coming back to the market. So that's kind of what we saw um, during the pandemic two years ago. And that felt, made us feel the wheel was speeding back up again. Coming off of the 2018, 2019 uh, heavy two years of crops, we did see a very uh, a serious slowdown in contracting, especially moving into 20. Um, but then uh, pantry stocking during the pandemic definitely increased case goods. We saw sales increase and wineries coming back to the market to um, purchase more fruit at decent pricing. And that held through 21 um, and 22. Now that we're in 23, uh, we're seeing a little bit of a pushback here. We first thought that maybe we'd move through the excess section of the wheel when uh, we saw the, saw the upturn during the pandemic. And the wheel is round and it goes through transitions between excess and, um, and not enough for, so peak of shortage. So originally we thought maybe we'd push directly through the peak of excess during the pandemic and moved back to the transition to a peak of shortage. But now um, that we've studied the market a little bit better, we actually think we kind of went backwards during the pandemic and now we're back into the transition between peak of shortage and peak of excess, leaning towards a peak of excess at this point, just based on case good sales and winery sales and consumption in the market. So here we have the California statewide uh, tons crushed. And uh, as you can tell, in 2022, we're uh, down in tons, uh, but we are also down in 21 and 20. A lot of the 20 tons, though, we don't really count uh, because a lot of that fruit due to smoke damage was not taken in by the wineries. So, um, but three years of a downturn since 2018 in tons, uh, total tons crushed. So that equals lighter crops for three years in a row. And a lot of the wineries did rejected uh, some fruit and then they didn't have any inventory. So at that point we were backing up on bulk gallons, uh, probably to the peak of our uh, bulk gallons listed ever. And 21 came around and we saw a huge uh, decrease in gallons available. We saw those gallons sell and then we saw wineries coming back to the market. So 22 really mirrored uh, 2011 in regards to the tons crushed. 
And uh, there was a lot of grapes pulled out also in the Interior Valley with nut crops, almonds, and pistachios doing really well in the market, walnuts as well. Uh, winery, our growers were uh, taking old vineyards out and replacing them with uh, almonds. And uh, we've seen a slowdown in that. As most of you probably know, that market has also slowed down itself. And so now we're kind of, uh, well, we felt last year we were in a more balanced position. Now it's feeling a little bit underbalanced. Next slide, please. So here we have tons crushed by region, and uh, I, I like this slide uh, just because the North Coast actually is the only winner here. So all other regions, Central Coast, Northern Interior, Southern Interior, were all down again in 2022 in tons uh, produced compared to the five-year average. We were actually up in the North Coast, Lake and Mendocino and Napa specifically. Uh, we saw actually Lake County had broke its production record for Cabernet Sauvignon in 2022, and so did Mendocino County. And we think that's a byproduct, not of a large crop, because we know, most of you know, the crop was pretty light last year, especially on the hillsides. But we did see uh, new vineyards coming online. And even though it was first year crop on most of those vineyards, it did add to the total and it did increase the total tons produced in those both those counties, Lake County and Mendocino County. And apologies, I should have said this earlier, when we refer to the North Coast at turn time, we're talking about Lake and Mendocino County combined. We combine those two regions. They're small regions, and the numbers don't always, aren't enough numbers for us to calculate graphs and, and have these spreads, so we combine those two and acres planted so we can get good, good reading and good numbers that we can share with you. So next slide, please. And then here we have bulk by region, and this is an important slide I want everyone to pay attention to. Um, we're almost at 22 million gallons of bulk wine listed available with us. That's to the far right-hand side in the 2023. If you look back, we haven't been at this point since about 2020 or 2019, and uh, that was when we were at the peak of excess. And then we saw a huge drop in 21 and 22 on bulk gallons, and that was wineries coming back to the, to the party one might say, and purchasing more wine because sales were increasing. And now we're, the anomaly about this slide is we have never seen this amount of gallons backed up into the market following a short or light crop. So that is the anomaly that we're watching very closely. It's surprising to us. So uh, most of this fruit was contracted and taken by wineries and then relisted back onto the market with us to sell because they over estimated the tons and gallons they needed to produce based on case good sales. So um, that is the most interesting. All the other peaks in 20, 2019, 2015, 2016, and all the way back to 2010, all of those peaks did not follow a short or light crop. Those were average crops or better. And uh, we, we expect to see bulk gallons come back onto the market after a large crop, but not after a short crop. So that is worrisome in the market. Next slide, please. So now we'll talk about Cab Sauv, the most important grape, I would say, in the North Coast, most widely planted. Next slide. Here we have tons crushed, Cabernet recent crop history. And um, looking at the North Coast, uh, you can see in the, on the right-hand side is gray. That's 2022, all the way over to the left-hand side, 2018. And 2022 uh, had the highest production in the North Coast for Cabernet in the last five years and ever. Um, other regions, such as Central Coast, were way down. Um, Lodi was down. Southern Interior was down. Sonoma was about the same as 2021. And then Napa was a little bit up from 2021. Um, that all contributed to uh, the position we're in currently with Cabernet Sauvignon in the North Coast, which is uh, it's feeling a little bit long. We don't have a lot of activity out there. We're missing some of the buyers that we'd seen in the last 10 years. And part of that was some of the big Valley buyers that were coming over here to make their California blends better with some of our North Coast fruit to compete on the bottom shelf market. And those folks just have not been to the market so far. But we are running you know, quite a bit later this year in the growing season than we've seen in the last three years. And we're hopeful that those, uh, those markets will pick back up and those wineries will be back into the market to purchase some. Uh, cab sob this year. Next slide. And then here we have um, our district average pricing and our spot market uh, turn time pricing, and then our spot high and our spot low in turn time. So the uh, yellow line is the district average for Lake and Mendocino uh, pricing for Cabernet, and that's running about $2,000 a ton. Our 
spot market pricing for turntine is the red line with the triangles, and we're pretty close to matching that, that district average. And then we have our spot high, which is the top uh, tight dotted line, and our spot low. So we did see some sales, uh, you know, reach $2,500 a ton, but we also saw some grapes last year sell at uh, below $1,500 a ton in Cabernet. So it's a pretty widespread there. And when I see a widespread on all four of those, uh, those lines, I, it tells me that it's an out of balanced market. Typically, if we see all those lines kind of merging together at the end there in 2022, uh, it tends to be a fairly balanced mar market. So when you watch these graphs, pay attention to that, to the spread on the lines at the end in 2022, that should give you an idea of where we feel the market is, whether it's balanced or not balanced. Next slide, please. And then here we have the Cabernet Sauvignon bulk gallons activity for sale. So um, the gray obviously is California Appalachian. Um, the green is Central Coast. The yellow is us in North Coast. Red is Sonoma and Napa Valley is blue. So clearly we have very few gallons of available Napa Cabernet. And so the Napa Cabernet market has stayed very active, very, very uh, tight market, not very much fruit available down there. But uh, we up here, uh, being the yellow, um, are pushing close to 2 million gallons listed um, on the market of Cabernet in the North Coast. And that, once again, that's a combination of Lake and Mendocino County. Um, obviously, Central Coast has quite a few more gallons too. They're pushing uh, above 2 million. And then we have the Central Valley going all the way up to uh, 6 million um, there. So the Central Valley is really backed up on Cabernet. Here we have our Lake County Cabernet Sauvignon Blanc bulk gallons available and weighted average price. So um, obviously we are in 2023 at the far right hand corner. If you look at 2022, we saw some gallons back up, but those depleted during the winter back down to, um, you know, maybe uh, a, a million or two million gallons. But now here we are, are I'm sorry, to a million gallons, but here we are back up to two. Um, two plus million gallons of Lake County Cabernet uh, backed up onto the market, which is not a good sign for the grape market because what we typically have seen at Turntine is the grape market follows the bulk wine market. So as gallons of uh, bulk wine back up in our system and are put on the market for sale, uh, typically within a year or more, we will see grapes start to back up the same way. Um, and the blue line is kind of like uh, of us following the pricing for what we've seen and where pricing has, has been landing for those gallons. And the blue line all the way to the far right is right around the $15 per gallon uh, mark. And we just, where there's breaks and misses, there's just not been that much activity. We have not moved that line, so we don't track that. We don't have tracking on that number. Um, but the, the gallons are backing up and the price seems to be going down. Next slide, please. Here we have our Cabernet weighted average price per gallon. Um, once again, the yellow line is us up here in Lake and Mendocino County, and that's correlating pretty close to 15 or 12 to $15 per gallon. Um, Central Coast is selling a little bit cheaper, nine, eight to $9 per gallon. And then, uh, you know, the Central Valley's in uh, the, the gray or brown, um, that's below $5. And Napa is the blue, the top, and that's going between 40 and 45 dollars a gallon currently is what we're seeing in the market. Um, next slide, please. Sauvignon Blanc. So we got past the bad story. We're on to the good story. Sauvignon Blanc, um, strong in the market, a lot of activity. Uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have multiple buyers in the market actively looking for Sauvignon Blanc from Lake County. Uh, I, I believe the Wine Commission has done a great job in marketing Sauvignon Blanc for this county and built its reputation around this varietal. I know some of you growers out there who do a, a great job with it and have also contributed to that marketing. And um, it's it, Lake County is known um, throughout the state. So we have uh, multiple buyers from South Central Valley that come up looking for uh, Sauvignon Blanc in Lake County and Napa, Napa wineries who can't seem to find it in Napa County anymore look to Lake County next for their, um, for their needs. And so it's a great, great story, Sauvignon Blanc. Next slide, please. Here we have Sauvignon Blanc recent crop history. And uh, we did do better in Sauvignon Blanc in the North Coast, um, almost uh, matched or tied. Uh, the high in 2019 of tons produced, and that's a combination, again, of Lake and Mendocino County. Um, other regions didn't do as well. Uh, Napa did a little bit better than in 21. 
Uh, Central Coast was down quite a bit, so that brought a lot of buyers from the Central Coast up to the North Coast, and uh, the Delta, Lodi area, and Southern Interior were once again down. In general, uh, I'll say that 2021 across the state was the largest production of Sauvignon Blanc in the entire state uh, history. So there was a lot of new tons that came on in 21 in the Central Coast and Central Valley. A lot of Central Valley growers, wine grape growers, switched from Chardonnay to Sauvignon Blanc, predicting there'd be a shift that direction. And those tons definitely showed up in force in 2021. Now those crops were down again in 2022, and anyone who's grown enough Sauvignon Blanc knows that it can be that way. It can be a big crop one year and then not very much crop the next year. So um, we're expecting that crop to come back up again in the Interior Valley and uh, in the Central Coast, and that's gonna put pressure on our market. But as for now and today, we're seeing a lot of activity, good activity, good pricing, best pricing we've seen in the history of this county on Sauvignon Blanc. And that's even coming off of a better crop than we saw in 2021 uh, for the North Coast. Again, it was a, it was a good crop. Next slide, thank you. Uh, here we have our district average price per ton spot market. And um, again, we see these, uh, these lines down, all the way down into 2022 to the right hand side, all merging and they're merging up. So that is a good sign for the market. That's a good sign of interest in this varietal, in this market, in this area. Uh, we saw, once again, some of our highest pricing above $2,000 a ton for Sauvignon Blanc in 2022, which is a uh, great price. I've been growing Sauvignon Blanc for a very long time here in Lake County, and I would never saw that kind of pricing for Sauvignon Blanc in the 10 years that I was, I was growing it. So very happy to see that for that varietal in this region. I'm glad our reputation is getting well known for Sauvignon Blanc in the whole state of California. Next slide. And here we have um, Turrentine's, uh, Turrentine spot market grape pricing. This is a percent change in price that we saw in 21 compared to 22. And we saw on the North Coast for Sauvignon Blanc a 35% increase in pricing from 21 to 22. Um, that's a huge jump. Sonoma County, Sonoma County only jumped 33%. I think uh, the North Coast had the biggest jump percentage in pricing from the 21 harvest to the 22 harvest. Next slide, please. And then here we have the bulk gallons availability. You, as you can see, we're well below a million gallons on Sauvignon Blanc. We do have some availability. Once again, that's the yellow is Lake County and Mendocino County, and, uh, but not very much. And anyone who's worked with Sauvignon Blanc is if you don't get it sold in February or March, uh, the market kind of drops away. So uh, these are gallons that were probably held on the market a little bit too long or listed late that um, the buyers kind of moved past. Um, Sauvignon Blanc's a hard uh, varietal to blend into white blends or mix with Chardonnay, so, um, but not very many gallons left available. We do have a small amount of Sonoma County and a tiny bit of Napa County, and I would say most of that wine was just missed the market and presented late or um, off timing, or some of it could even be left over a little bit from the year before. Next slide, please. And then here we have, uh, once again, apologies for the broken uh, white or uh, blue lines up there, but that's um, where we, we track marketing and large sales. Um, we have uh, seen the pricing going up on this per gallon, um, but really from 21 to 22, you see a big blank right there. That's because we just didn't have any available. We didn't have any sales. All that fruit was taken or all that juice was kept by the winery. So there was very little uh, fruit available. Now we're starting to see a little bit put back on the market all the way into 2023, and that would have been 2022 uh, crushed fruit, and not very much though, um, well below 100,000 gallons, and uh, that is still trading at somewhere, and the blue line, I think it's right around 12 to $14 a gallon. So uh, trading very closely to the Cabernet price per gallon, um, which is not a good sign for Cabernet, but a great sign for Sauvignon Blanc. Next slide, please. And we'll talk about Chardonnay. I know we don't grow very much Chardonnay in Lake County, but it is a, an important varietal in the industry. And I think it, we can draw some information from this varietal just in general about the market. Please, next slide. So um, once again, we're in the North Coast there. Uh, most of that fruit is uh, Mendocino County on the chart. Uh, they did better in uh, 21 than they did in, I mean, better in 22 than they did in 21. Uh, we saw a little increase in uh, production, a little increase in tons, but overall, in general, the state was down in Chardonnay significantly. And then we've seen 
um, a huge increase in interest in all North Coast Chardonnay. So no North Coast Chardonnay, even Lake County, has interested buyers. Um, we've pretty much worked through all the availability in Sonoma County, and now those wineries have started looking to, into Lake and Mendocino County for their Chardonnay needs to, to make up the differences they were unable to obtain in Sonoma County, mostly, and Napa County. Um, so we are seeing activity there. Chardonnay seems to be a strong varietal. We have multiple wineries. Sparkling houses have been doing very well in the market, and many sparkling houses have been out contracting Chardonnay in the North Coast for their sparkling programs. Um, a little le less price, but you get to pick it early, so um, we're glad to see those companies doing well, and um, we're glad to see the activity on white grapes. White grapes in general in the market have been more popular than red grapes this year to start off the uh, year. We're hoping that kind of switches a little bit because we're moving through the white grapes. There's not very many left tons available, uh, but we still have quite a few tons of red grapes left available. Next slide, please. So here's our um, spot market versus district average and spot high and low again. Um, these, these ones are merging in completely different directions, which worries me in regards to the balance of the market. Um, obviously, our spot average uh, is a little bit higher than the district average uh, for what we saw grapes selling for in 2022, um, but uh, not too far off. Um, $1,400 a ton seems to be the going rate, especially in Mendocino County, $1,450 maybe. Uh, sparkling, it's around $13, $13.50 a ton. Um, but we do see a, quite a divergence in the spot high and the low. Um, some of the spot high reaching up to upwards to $1,700 a ton, and the spot low as low as $600 a ton. So um, I think that low is probably a little bit of excess that was sold late in the end of the season that didn't have a contract, um, probably overage tons, and that's icing on the cake. Um, next slide, please. So here we have the uh, percent change um, in regards to pricing on Chardonnay compared to Napa County, Sonoma County, and North Coast, which is Lake and Mendocino. Uh, North Coast jumped 11%, uh, Napa Valley Hat and Sonoma County around 18 and 19% price difference. Um, so everything has been going up in price on white grapes. Um, can't say the same for red grapes in the North Coast. Next slide, please. And here we have our gallons available. Again, not too many. Um, the largest amount are from the Interior Valley. Uh, not too many yellow uh, gallons available. That's North Coast. Um, zero Napa and a little bit of Sonoma gallons available on the market currently. So white grapes, again, trending popular. Um, not too hard to sell. Red grapes, a little bit more difficult. Next slide, please. And this is a really spotty uh, sales market. The blue lines, once again, are marked uh, price points for gallons. And uh, we don't have very many gallons available uh, in the North Coast, 50,000 maybe. Um, that's a low number compared to what we've seen in the past. And pricing is right around 10 to $12 per gallon is what we've seen uh, Lake and Mendocino County bulk wine trading for. Next slide, please. Talk about red blenders now. Um, I know we grow a lot of Petit Syrah, uh, Zinfandel, Malbec here in Lake County. Uh, all those varietals, Petit Verdot, are included in this um, red blenders slide, so keep that in mind as we're mo moving through these slides. Next, please. So red blenders, uh, recent crop history, we did all right. Actually, we beat um, the 2021 crop on red blenders in 2022. Uh, that was a little bit heavier of a crop, um, matched the 2018 crop again in the North Coast. Uh, Sonoma was flat. Napa was a little bit above what they had produced in 21, but nowhere near their 2018 and 2019 crops. Central Coast was way down, um, back to the 2020 crop load, and uh, Lodi and Southern Interior both down compared to 2021. So we saw strong demand in uh, red blenders last year and the year before. Lake and Mendocino County, Petit Syrah leading that charge, I would say. Um, good activity. Uh, we're still seeing fair activity in those uh, markets and that varietals, those varietals here in Lake and Mendocino County, but I am sensing a slowdown in the market on those as well. They're starting to pair up with uh, Cabsov. I think early buyers were out and got what they needed and now we're, uh, the, everyone's waiting to see what the crop's gonna look like to see if they're gonna come in and pick up some more tons or if they're gonna wait and if it's gonna be a heavy crop buying cheaper later in the season. Next, next slide, please. And um, I'm really not sure what that uh, anomaly is. I call it the hat. 
Um, so someone came in and picked up uh, quite a few tons um, from 2016 to 2020 at a very expensive pricing, upwards of $8,000 a ton. I'm not sure where that happened or who that was, but um, ignore that. Uh, we're looking at about $2,000 a ton for red blenders in the North Coast. Most, all those lines coming together pretty evenly. A little bit uh, spot low, you know, is. 1500 spot high is 2800 a ton on red blenders so um, that's the tracking that we've done at turn time spot market is right on top of the district average there um, at the end in 2022 so we're calling it about two thousand dollars a ton is what we feel is fair market price on red blenders and once again we've seen fair activity early this season on red blenders but that market has slowed and this tends to be time of the season for that everybody wants to see how crop set comes and Cluster counts looked uh, average plus so far, some, some better, um, but everyone's waiting to see how that crop sets and what, what kind of crop that's gonna be. The wineries will wait until they have a better indication of what that crop's gonna be before they come back and finalize their allocations. I will say in the last two years, the wineries that waited and hoped that the crop was gonna be bigger um, all ended up paying more money at the end of the season for the same amount of fruit and uh, they had to pay higher pricing. They're, all the wineries are hoping that, that it doesn't occur again this year with all the rains that we received. Um, most of them are hoping for a, a heavier crop where they can come in a little bit lighter than what they paid the last few years for these varietals and all varietals. Next slide, please. Um, Red Blenders, the spot market change. This was a big one for the North Coast. Spot market change between 2021 and 2022 is 21%. Um, some of the largest gains uh, out of any of the varietals. Um, good gains for growers up here. We're glad to see that market come back around. I remember five years ago when we were selling Petit Sera for fourteen or $1,300 a ton. And uh, then here we are at 2000 again. So strong market, uh, as I said earlier, we still have buyers out there looking at these grapes and uh, it's not in the same category as Ca Cabernet Sauvignon. Next slide, please. And here's the gallons. Um, as you can see, we don't have too many gallons available and that's a good sign for the market. Um, for red blenders, except for in the interior. So the interior, once again, are struggling. As I mentioned earlier, that bottle price saw the largest drop in percentage sales in the history of that, uh, that bottle price, which is $5.99 and below, dropped 6%. And uh, that has definitely put a slowdown on the interior value, which in turn, in a way, a roundabout way, brings a slower market here to the North Coast because a lot of those buyers do come over here to the North Coast and pick up some uh, better better fruit to be competitive on the market against their competitors. So we're not seeing those buyers in the market so far this year, although we're hoping that they are still coming. Um, sales, uh, new numbers come in every month and as those sales increase and we expect them to increase, those wineries hopefully will be back in the market. Next slide, please. Um, here we go, the, the gallons of red blenders and pricing that we've seen. Um, upwards to 16 to $17 a gallon for some red blenders in 2023. Uh, not very many gallons, 300,000 um, total. Most of those gallons are interior, interior Valley grapes, not our North Coast grapes, um, but still strong market, strong demand in, for those varietals. Next slide, please. And to finish off, um, these are just a few things I wanna leave everybody with today. Uh, three years in a row, ununiform yields, which causes uncertainty in the market, uncertainty by wine grape buyers, and everyone is kind of trying to figure it out. And it's been hard to figure out with the uh, lack of uniformity in crop. We've seen three short crops um, in a row. That spurred a lot of buying. Um, we're catching up to that now. Gallons are getting put back down the market, and we're starting to see a slowdown, especially in Cabernet, um, for purchasing tons. Um, the market is more balanced. Uh, it's felt more balanced the last three years, not based on consumption, but based on um, demand for those grapes. A lack um, of availability with short crops caused competition amongst the buyers that were out there. That um, proved price to get stronger for the grower, and um, that has kept everybody in business. Um, the challenges are to cost of operation and inflation for all. That's the biggest challenge for wineries and growers. We all have to work together to get through this. Um, we've been through times like this before. I'm sure we'll get through these times again. Um, and that's what I got for you today. So appreciate your time. I think we'll take some questions here now. If anyone has a question, I'm here to try to give you an answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, great uh, uh, talk. Thank you so much. I'm Andre Gesiek at the Mont saint -Henri Vineyard. Uh, quick question, I'm assuming Cabernet Franc, you qualified as a red blender, correct? 
Correct, we do. Those, that Cab Franc was blended into the red blends, yes. And so what would be the explanation why the red blenders are doing well, while the Cabernet Sauvignon is singled out as not doing well at all? I mean, they seem to go together, supposed to blend together, don't they? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think wineries, you know, um, first off, we don't have as many uh, acres planted to those red blenders as we do to Cabernet. So that's a big, big difference. And the wineries um, who have been purchasing the red blenders um, don't come up, we're not trying to sell them thousands of tons of Cabernet. They come up and buy two truckloads of Cab Franc and um, that's it, right? And so, because there's so limited plantings of it and so few acres, it, it, uh, it seems to move a little bit faster, and a little bit of Cab Franc goes a long way. Uh, Tia Russell with Lordy Nursery. Um, you said that people weren't coming over to buy the reds. Do you think maybe they're going into other areas to buy the reds? That is a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, yes. So I feel like, and I've felt this way for the past 10 years, that our number one competition in Lake County for Cabernet has been the Central Coast and Paso Robles. And they've done a great job of marketing their Cabernet. I don't know if any of you have tried it. It's highly doctored Cabernet, but um, they've done, done a really good job of, of marketing themselves down there. And being so close to LA, they've uh, done some sponsorships at um, large events and gotten some really good recognition for their uh, value and their quality. So um, another factor that factors into that is that when we started having the smoke events, up here in Lake County 2014. Bruce and I remember those very well, working together at Shannon Ranches. Um, you know, wineries started second guessing their purchases up here in Lake and Mendocino County, and they started looking elsewhere that they felt were maybe a safer play in regards to red grapes. And we saw a, a drive down to the Central Coast, and they ended up finding some quality down there, especially around the Paso Robles area, that worked for their programs, and they felt the risk to any kind of smoke damage was less down there, and they've stuck down there. Now, it's gonna be our job in this industry is to bring them back up here, and I don't, um, entirely know how we do that. I do think that our quality is higher quality here in the North Coast, especially in Lake and Mendocino County for Cabernet. Um, but the other difficulty is, is the farms in cent Central Coast are typically very large and institutional. And when you have large farming, as anybody who out here, and most of you know, and you can spread your tractor costs and your, uh, your pruning costs and your labor costs and everything else across a large number of acres, you can offer that great at a cheaper price per ton because your farming costs are cheaper because you spread those costs. And that's what Central Coast does really well um, to beat us to the market is they will adapt to the market quicker, in my experience, and drop that price per ton to drag those wineries over to them before we've, and, and I mean, the growing season happens faster down there too. So they know what their crop load looks like before we know what it looks like up here. But um, by, by being able to offer that fruit at a cheaper price earlier than we can in the North Coast, they've, they've taken away a lot of the winery business from us in the North Coast here. They're able to adapt, they're able to spread that cost across thousands of acre plantings where most of us are small independent um, growers, you know, 40, 50, 100 acres is a big ranch in Lake and Mendocino County for vineyards. Um, so that, that has also been a difficulty that we're gonna have to up here in the North Coast somehow overcome. I think our association and our proximity to Napa has been doing a good job of, of counterbalancing that but um, we still are losing ground to the Central Coast, for sure. Any more questions? Well, thank you all for having me here today. It's a pleasure to speak to all of you. My heart's with Lake County, always will be. Thank you so much. Christian lives in Upper Lake, so bug him. If you need help selling fruit, bug him. He loves Lake County, so let's, uh, let's beat him up a little bit by helping us sell our fruit. Um, okay, let's see here. Today we're excited to welcome a team of researchers from the U.S. Geolog Geological Survey California Volcano Observatory. For the past several years, have been studying the volcanics of the Clear Lake volcanic field. Today we have with us a research geophysicist, Michael Mitchell, volcanic hazards and communications specialist, Jessica Ball, research geologist, Seth Burgess, um, Michael focuses on using gravity, magnetic, and MT databases to better understand the magmatic plumbing of the Clear Lake volcanic field. 
characterize the volcanic hazards and elevate the threat of the Clear Lake volcanic field poses to nearby communities. He holds a uh, Bachelor's of Science in Geophysical Engineering from the Colorado School of Mines, a Master's of Philo uh, Philosophy in Earth Science from the University of Cambridge, and a PhD in Geophysics from the University of British Columbia. Jessica is a physical volcanologist who specializes in volcanic stability and associated hazards, as well as a volcanic hazard modeling and communication. She leads activities and the intersection of hazardous research and risk communication, translating volcanic hazard information to policy makers, civil authorities, and the public in California. She holds a Bachelor's of Science from the College of William & Mary and a PhD in the University of Buffalo. Seth is a research geologist specializing in accessory mineral geochronology. He is focused on the application of uranium-based geochronometers and date volcanic rocks for the purpose of accurately determining the timing of voluminous eruptions and for constructing comprehensive eruption histories of long-lived volcanic systems characterized by the potential future volcanic hazard. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Soil Science from Cal Poly, a Master's of Science in Geology in the San Jose State, and a PhD in Geology from MIT. Uh, please welcome Michael, Jessica, and Seth. Hi, I'm Seth. That's Jess. That's Mike Mitchell. And we're going to do something a bit different than the first talk. We're going to kind of take you through some Geology 101 if you never took that. You're about to in 20 or 30 minutes or so. Um, we work for the California Volcano Observatory, which is under the umbrella of the Department of the Interior and the US Geological Survey. And we are charged with understanding the volcanoes in California and how they might impact the infrastructure and the people that live in California from a hazards perspective. So we do fundamental research science to inform ourselves as to what might happen in the future with respect to California volcanoes. There are active volcanoes in California, and we classify their activity based on how recently they have erupted, how close they are to population centers, whether or not there are lots of flights that go through that area each day. And believe it or not, Clear Lake counts as a quote unquote high threat volcano under the eyes of the USGS volcano observatories. And as a result, in the late 70s, quite a bit of work was done in the Clear Lake area trying to understand um, the potential for geothermal production here. Obviously, you're all familiar with the geysers. And a lot of that work kind of informed our understanding of the, the life cycle of the Clear Lake volcanic field. But not a lot has been done since then. So if you look at our publications from the USGS, uh, on the hazards of the Clear Lake volcanic field, there's just kind of a big ellipse over the area. It's not a very nuanced hazard assessment. So we figured that it would be a good time because since the 1970s, there have been significant advances in analytical techniques and we're able to build a much more nuanced hazard assessment of the volcanic field. So for the last few years, we have been out here banging on rocks, trying to understand the volcanic field. The Clear Lake Volcanic Field is not alone, it's non-unique in California. There are a series of volcanic fields stretching in time and in space all the way down to San Luis Obispo. Anybody ever been to Morro Rock? On your way to taste those Paso cabs? It's okay. That are doctored, evidently? Um, <laughs> uh, Morro Rock is about 30 million years old, and it was erupted as a result of the same tectonic setup as Clear Lake. So there are three major plate boundaries in tectonics. So the first is called um, a convergent plate boundary. And this is where oceanic crust to the left is subducting beneath continental crust, which is what's on the right of that block diagram there in the middle. And when you subduct ocean crust beneath a continent, you can promote melting in that downgoing plate and above the melting zone on that downgoing plate, you get volcanoes. All the cascade volcanoes that we see that I show on that diagram to the right are a result of a subduction zone and this convergent plate boundary. So keep that in your mind. We're going to go to the next one. 
instead of shoving plates together, we can pull them apart. And volcanism occurs when you pull plates apart because it allows for melt to propagate up from depth. And so this is a spreading center tectonic boundary. And you can see the East Pacific Rise and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge are both examples of that that are enormous. But there are also much smaller spreading centers throughout the oceans. And it's a place where we build new crust. The next boundary, and next slide, is a transform boundary. You're all Californians, or at least sitting in California today if from elsewhere. California is characterized by a world famous transform boundary, the San Andreas Fault. It separates the Pacific and North American plates when they slide past one another. So those are the three different tectonic boundaries, and they don't have to occur in a vacuum. They can interact and do interact with one another. And the reason the Clear Lake volcanic field is here, and the reason all these other volcanic fields stretch south to Sonoma, or to, uh, to San Luis Obispo, is because of the interaction of these plates. So let's go to the next slide. This is the current tectonic setting of Western North America on the left. The long red line cutting through California and la labeled San Andreas Fault is the San Andreas Fault. There's a subduction zone north of that. It's got the little teeth on it where the Juan de Fuca plate is being shoved beneath the North American plate. We get volcanoes there, the Cascade volcanoes. And then right off the Mendocino fracture zone, between the Pacific plate and the Juan de Fuca plate, there's a spreading center. So we have all three of those boundaries now to the north of us in coastal California and, and southern Oregon. So you can see on the right-hand side a three-dimensional version of that where the Juan de Fuca plate is being subducted. The Pacific plate is diverging from that subducting Juan de Fuca plate. And just south of that, not shown in the diagram, we have the San Andreas Fault. All right, now, surprisingly, I'm going to put this all together, I promise. So before we play the video, if we can play the video, just below where it says Farallon plate, you see the little crinkle right there? I want you to focus on that spot. This is what California coastline looked like 30 or actually 40 million years ago. So on the far right, there's a timeline. 40 million years ago to the present. And when we click go on this, you'll see the evolution of this tectonic environment. And when that spreading center on the left-hand side of the Farallon plate contacts Western North America, one side of the spreading center falls underneath the continent. And when it does so, it opens a gap in the lithosphere through which melt can propagate. So instead of getting volcanoes way down uh, inland, like you do in the Cascades, you end up with volcanoes very near the coast because of this thing called a slab window. Okay. So hit the video and let's see if it plays. Ooh, look at that. OK, here we go. So 30 million years ago, boom, at San Luis Obispo, you contact and you start making volcanoes. As the San Andreas Fault grows through time, that triple junction, or the nexus of those three plates, travels north. So there's Baja separating, and at the present, we look just like that. So over 40 million years, the San Andreas Fault has grown. That transform boundary has lengthened as subduction has been pushed northward. So we no longer have subduction zone volcanoes in California. They're all up in Oregon because that triple junction, the nexus of those plate boundaries, has moved north. Somebody nod at me. Yes. OK, good. <laughs> so can we play that again just for fun? So 30 million years ago, bang, San Luis Obispo. And as that plate subducts and breaks away, you get melt coming up through. And instead of generating volcanoes inland, like as inland as Shasta, we generate them along the coast of California. Clear Lake is one of those. All right, next slide. So there are lots and lots of volcanic rocks associated with this migrating triple junction. And every dot on that map is some nerdy geologist out banging on rocks saying, well, there's one here. Put it on the map. And these are all the ones south of the Bay Area, and they range in age from about 30 million years ago to the present, or 30 million years ago to 10 million years ago. Younger than 10 million years is where we're standing now. Let's go to the next slide. So here they are. San Luis Obispo is hazy down there at the bottom. You've heard of the pinnacles. That's one of these. 
the Berkeley Hills, if you go down toward Berkeley and you look up at those beautiful, I mean, it looks like Napa Valley just shoved down there, the big cliffs above Berkeley, that's this stuff. It's about 15 million years old. The Sonoma Volcanic Field, Mount St. Helena, is one of these. It's about 2.85 million years old. And the Clear Lake Volcanic Field is the youngest and the northernmost of them all. And it ranges in age from about 3 million years old to as young as 8,000 years, which geologically is quite young, which is why we're getting paid to be here <laughs> and study this stuff. Um, so that is the chain of volcanoes that has been in place as that triple junction migrated northward. Cool? Let's go to the next one. So the Clear Lake volcanic field is not characterized by big explosive eruptions. It's mostly lava domes, small lava flows. And although it would pose great risk to the local population, sorry, it's not so much of a risk more broadly. But just to the south, the Sonoma volcanic field is characterized by big explosions. The stuff that makes up Mount St. Helena, which has been uplifted along a fault and exposed for us to see, is what's called an ash flow tuff. It petrified the forest that you can see over near Calistoga, and it erupted explosively and in great volume, greater volume than anything at Clear Lake, and it sent ash all the way down to Bakersfield. So if something like that, and that happened three million years ago, if something like that were to happen today, we'd be in trouble. So Clear Lake has been erupting for about three million years, the Sonoma volcanic field had been erupting for about five and a half before that big eruption occurred. So we really want to understand the relationship between Clear Lake and Sonoma and the life cycle of this volcanic field to ascertain whether or not it's on its way to a big eruption or is likely just to continue as business as usual. Next slide. So the Clear Lake volcanic field sits where it sits because it's between faults that are associated with the San Andreas. Movement along these faults creates space in the crust for magma to reach the surface. And so we sit in this fault-bounded basin, and that controls the location, primarily, of the volcanic field. So the faults are labeled on the left. The map on the right shows the Clear Lake volcanic field volcanic rocks in green, stretching from Canocti and High Valley on the north, northernmost part, all the way down damn near to Berryessa. All right, so here's the geologic map, and we have some of these out front that you can look at, and they're free to download online. I know this is what you all want on your bedroom windows or bedroom walls. Um, as I said, it was mapped in the 70s, focusing on the geothermal potential. We got about 12 cubic miles of total volcanic rock it's been going on since about three million years ago, although not continuously. It erupts in what we think are episodes of high volume eruptions separated by periods of relative quiescence. Um, and it's characterized by volcanic domes. Mount Kanaktai is a series of volcanic domes, sort of like toothpaste of subtly different compositions squeezed off over maybe tens of thousands to 100,000 years. Um, and Clear Lake is generally younger to the northeast, so the oldest rocks that are around three million years old are those down by Lake Berryessa. Those rocks out on Butts Canyon, up on the, on the uh, tops of the ridges, those are all two and a half million year old basaltic andesites. And it ranges young all the way north. The rocks in High Valley that you've all planted grapes on are uh, some of the youngest lava flows in the whole field. They're somewhere on the order of eight to 10,000 years old, but we haven't directly dated them. We're working on that. Next slide. So I think I've well motivated why we're interested in studying the Clear Lake volcanic field. It has the potential to end up looking like the Sonoma volcanic field. It's a populated area, and it's the closest young volcanic field to the very densely populated uh, San Francisco Bay Area. So next slide. So what are, what are we doing out here other than driving around in a blue truck, knocking on doors, and asking to bang on rocks in your lovely vineyards? <laughs> um, we've got a bunch of different people at the USGS. On, well, there's five or six of us on this team. And each of us does something uh, more nuanced than the next. So I'm, as you heard, a uranium-lead 
geochronologist, I date rocks. Mike does geophysics, Jess does physical volcanology, and we have people doing other things as well. And so Mike and Jess will talk in a bit more detail about their work specifically, but I thought I'd give you just a flavor of the stuff that we're doing out here as fundamental science, trying to build our understanding of the potential for future volcanic hazards. So let's go to the next slide. And oh, all of those yellow dots are places that we have been and bagged a little bag of rocks. So we're all over the place in our little blue Ford Ranger <laughs> that have been for the last few years. Let's go to the next slide. So here are some of the spots we've been. You'll likely recognize some of these. The one in the bottom middle is out uh, on the Langtree Estates, and they've been spectacular to us, and they're busy bees out there, and it's wonderful for us because we're used to banging on mush weathered rock at the surface, and that's not what we want. We'd much rather you guys take a D8 cat out there and plane off an entire lava flow and pack all the big, beautiful, nice boulders to the side so we can just drive up to them and swing a sledgehammer. <laughs> so we're forever indebted to uh, the folks that are putting in vineyards out here because it gives us a window in the subsurface and a quality of rock that we would otherwise never be able to get near. Um, let's go to the next slide. So we'll just talk. You can click again. Hopefully this stuff will show up. Yeah, just keep clicking until everything's there. Perfect. So this is a, a simple plot of magnesium versus silica. And in red are rocks from Lassen, but all the other symbols, all the circles are Clear Lake rocks. And so we span the compositional range of erupted igneous rocks from things that are really rich in silica, like 75 weight percent silica, to things that are 45 weight percent silica. A range in magnesium and iron and all the major elements and all the trace elements. So we kind of run the gamut. And we've got a really smart gal that is teasing out the subtleties of this geochemistry, trying to understand where these rocks were made in the crust, why they erupted the way they did, and whether or not there are any patterns in space and time as to the chemical composition of the rocks erupted, because that tells us something about what's happening at depth and what might happen in the future. Let's go to the next slide. As I said, we're also doing geochronology. We're trying to build an eruption history for the volcanic field, understanding what happened where and when. And so the colors on the volcanic field map here are just broad groupings of when things have happened. As I said, it youngs generally to the northeast. Let's go to the next slide. And here's all the rocks we've dated. That's age in millions of years on the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is uh, unitless. It just shows the samples ranked by time. So each of those dots is a rock that has been dated either by argon-argon geochronology, sort of like carbon dating, but with using isotopes with much longer half-lives, so it's usable for rocks of this antiquity, or uranium lead geochronology, which is what I do. So we've dated lots and lots of rocks trying to put together the eruption history of the field. Let's go to the next slide. We also have some folks doing what's called paleomagnetism. As a rock cools from a melt, the magnetic minerals in that rock align with the North Pole, just like a compass, and it locks it in. And so the North Pole processes slowly. There is what's called secular variation. And we know about the rate at which that processes. And if we presume that rate has been constant over time, we can drill a section of rocks, look at how much the secular variation varies in those rocks, and get some idea as to the longevity of eruption. So if, if you've got a stack of lava flows in that triangle, with A being the oldest and D being the youngest, if they all erupted within, let's say, 100 years of each other, on a secular variation plot, which is what you see on the bottom, they're all going to plot right on top of each other. If there was 100,000 years between them, it's going to be scattered all over the place. Let's go to the next slide. So that is what Kanakti looks like. Much of Kanakti built on the 1,000-year time scale, maybe even shorter. Some of it scattered around, so it's kind of a big pulse of dome building, and then a few bits and bobs here and there. Kind of cool work by uh, a couple of our colleagues. Go to the next slide. This is what the rocks out um, to the south 
east of the field look like? Those older basaltic, basaltic anisite rocks that are covered in vineyards now stretching out toward Berryessa. They are scattered all over the place. And that makes sense because the radiometric geochronology that we've done suggests that those rocks erupted from about 1.4 million years ago all the way back to about three. So very long-lived, small-volume eruptions that have since been dissected by faults, which is in great contrast to the big-volume eruptions of something like Canucti. Next. So I'm going to shut up, and hopefully I've motivated well uh, why we're out here and kind of the breadth of stuff we're doing. Mike is going to talk about geophysical surveys and trying to image what's happening beneath the ground. Go for it. Thank you all for your attention here. Um, so like Seth said, I'm mostly working on the geophysical side of this project and geophysics is a lot like medical imaging. We take some sort of a physical field that's coming in, it interacts with the subsurface and then we record it at some sort of station and based on the change from what's coming in to what we record after it's interacted with the ground, we can build up like a three-dimensional model of the distribution of some of these different physical properties in the subsurface. And so we can use a number of different techniques. We can look at gravity, we can look at magnetotellurics, we can look at like airborne magnetic inversions, and each of these different techniques is sensitive to a different physical property of the Earth and gives us kind of a different picture as to what's going on. So then if we can pull many of these different methods together, we can do what's called like a joint inversion where we, can where we can build one model that takes into account the contributions from these different methods and give us one model that can accurately reproduce all of these different data. Um, so I guess this on, on the slide here is a picture from the geysers, geothermal field, just south of us, and you can see all of the steam, some of it rising from fumaroles in the near field and then other from the power plants. So we know that there's still a a huge amount of heat in this area. But the big question is, is there still molten rock at depth that we need to be worried about erupting? So we're really trying to image any zones where this molten rock has accumulated in the subsurface. And we're gonna try to use geophysics to get at that. Next slide, please. Um, so here's just a little bit of background information. Um, for these geophysical methods, we do something with the data that's called geophysical inversion, and that's basically just trying to work backwards from the data on the right-hand side of the screen to produce a, a three-dimensional model of the subsurface that tells us kind of what's going on in terms of the physical properties. And to do that, we first have to break the subsurface up into a mesh of all of these little cells. And then in the inversion process, we're gonna change the physical properties of each of those little cells until we both fit our observed data and we have a model that is geologically reasonable. So there's kind of those two parts that we're trying to balance, making the model geologically reasonable, but also having it reproduce the, the measurements that we're making out in the field. Uh, next slide, please. So we're gonna start with uh, gravity data. We've this data has been collected all in this area all the way back to the 70s, so we've compiled a large data set of about 3,000 gravity measurements. Um, with a gravity measurement, you're basically just measuring the vertical component of the gravitational force that's pulling on the instrument right there at that one location. And using that, we can kind of highlight uh, density contrasts in the subsurface. So if you have let's say some sedimentary rocks that have a lot of pore space, those rocks are going to be less dense than maybe a, a basaltic, very mafic, volcanic rock that's very, just very dense and doesn't have a lot of pore space and has heavier minerals. So we'll, see, we'll be able to see the contrast between those different types of rocks in our inversion. Uh, next slide, please. So previous studies have identified this large regional gravity low that's centered about Mount Hanna and the geysers that's circled in red over there. Um, all those little green squares on the plot are showing the different power plants and the geysers, so that's kind of delineating that general geothermal field down there. And historically, there have been kind of two main interpretations to try to explain this regional gravity low that's been observed. The first, and probably the more popular one, is that 
there is some sort of a mid-crustal magma reservoir at depth where we have some of these molten rocks that have accumulated. And since they're partially molten, they have a lower density than the crust surrounding them. An alternative explanation that was put forward in the 90s said that, well, we might not need this partially molten rock. We could maybe explain the gravity low with just a really thick sequence. Um, five to seven kilometers would probably be about four miles thick. So a four mile thick sequence of sedimentary rocks that are part of the Great Valley sequence. So part of what we're doing with this gravity inversion research is trying to discriminate between those two hypotheses that have been put together and see if we can shed any light on which of them kind of holds more weight. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some of the results of our gravity inversions. Um, this is a kind of a cross-section that goes from southwest to northeast across the area, cutting through the geysers, Mount Hanna, and then extending up towards, um, well, just extending out across the Berryessa Fault and up that way to the northeast. And we see, the main thing that we see here is there's a, a density low beneath Mount Hanna, and then there's a little bit of a, like an intermediate density low beneath the geysers, which is probably the the intrusive rocks that sit beneath that geothermal field, so basically volcanic rocks that have been injected into the crust and have cooled underground. So those rocks are still a little bit less dense than the surrounding rocks, but they probably don't have a whole lot of melt left in them, so they're still, they have kind of this intermediate density. And then at depth, like six to 12 kilometers depth between the geysers and Mount Hanna, we see this larger low density zone that we're interpreting as a zone of, of, of partial melt in the subsurface. Uh, next slide, please. And so then, how can we kind of, are there things that we can compare those inversion results to to verify, to, to make sure that they're geologically reasonable? And one of the first things that we can turn to are geothermal borehole logs. And so on the Right there, you see kind of a lithologic interpretation of one of these boreholes, and then just to the left of it is a log of density. And the main thing that we see in this well, this well was drilled kind of right between Mount Hanna and Mount Kanaktai. In green there, you see this sequence of Great Valley rocks, which was kind of that secondary hypothesis. They were saying that maybe if you had like four miles of these Great Valley sediments, you could explain that gravity low. But in our borehole logs, we see that we only have a thin layer of these, of, of these Great Valley sedimentary rocks. In this case, it's only about 500 meters thick. So this kind of shoots a hole in that whole hypothesis that we have this huge thick package of sedimentary rocks sitting there because we don't see it in the borehole logs. So we have to kind of invoke something else that's deeper than these borehole logs to try to explain our low density. Um, and then at the very bottom of this well, there are a number of different mineral assemblages that we see down there that show evidence of contact metamorphism, which is basically when you have, you have melt injected into the crust in this area and it heats up the rock surrounding it and that heat and pressure alters the minerals that are in that rock. And so we see evidence of these intruded rocks at maybe a depth of about three to three and a half kilometers. And so this shows that kind of between the area between Mount Hanna and Mount Kanaktai, there may be an, intrusive, an area of intrusive rocks that is mostly solidified, kind of like we have underneath the geysers. And both of those systems may be being fed by this larger partial melt zone that we see at deeper depths of six to 12 kilometers. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of pulling everything together. Um, the top is, again, our results from the gravity inversion, and the bottom is kind of a stylistic or an interpretive cartoon that we made to try to explain what's going on with the geology. We have some of the more basaltic or mafic melts in the lower crust, and then kind of in those mid-crustal levels, we have the more silicic partial melt zone, and that 
that partial melt zone is then maybe feeding a pluton that sits underneath Mount Hanna and extends out towards Mount Kanakti and then may also be providing heat into the bottom of the um, geysers plutonic complex, which provides a heat source for that geysers geothermal field. Uh, next slide, please. And so, with any of these geophysical methods, they all have kind of blind spots. They all have things that they're not good at resolving. So by looking at different geophysical methods and combining the results, we can get a more holistic picture as to what's going on. So over the last two years, we've been going around collecting a new magnetotelluric data set, and a lot of you have been hugely helpful in that effort because you've given, given us access to your vineyards and property where we can set out these instruments and let them record data overnight. Um, so magnetotelurics is a natural source electromagnetic method. And so what we're doing is we're putting out a series of three magnetic field coils, which measure all three components of the magnetic field. So a north orient, north, south, east, west, and then a vertical component of it. And then we're setting out two pairs of electrodes, which are measuring variations in the electric field. And those are oriented north, south, and east, west. And we set those out and we allow them to record for like 18 to 24 hours. And in doing so, we're able to measure how those different fields are varying over a range of different frequencies. And that's gonna be important because each of those different frequencies are gonna give us information about a different depth in the subsurface. And with the gravity inversions where we were interested in the physical property of density, here we're, we're backing out the electrical conductivity of the surface. So how easily electric currents are able to flow through many of these different rocks. And again, if we have partial meltdown there, those electric currents are gonna flow easier than they would in the absence of some sort of a fluid or a, a partial melt. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a picture of what some of our instrumentation looks like. This is our colleague, Jared Peacock. Um, and so at the bottom, you see some of the magnetic field coils. They're about the size of a baseball bat. And then next to those are some of the um, electrodes, which each have like a, a 50 meter long coil of rope. And then in the middle that Jared is standing over is kind of the control box and the battery that powers the little control box where everything is recorded. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just some of the pictures of the installations. So for the horizontal magnetic field coils, we have to dig a, a trench that's maybe like four feet long, six inches wide, and six or eight inches deep. And so each of those coils, the north, south, and the east, west ones have to be put in pointing directly east, south, and northwest, and then they have to be perfectly level. And then the vertical one, it's not always possible around here to dig like a three or four foot deep hole and stick this thing in, bury it completely vertical. So many times we have to tie it to a big rock like that or a tree or something like that. And then the electrodes are easier to deploy. They're just a little hole that's about the size of like a, a large pop can and about six or eight inches deep. And we pour a little bit of water in there to kind of improve the contact resistance um, that the electrode has with the surrounding soil. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a map that's just kind of showing the distribution of these MT stations that we've put out over, over the region. You'll see a large cluster of them in the geysers. We've had an ongoing project there for the last two or three years where we've gone back and reoccupied the steam stations once per year to try to measure any changes in the steam field. And then the other ones are part of the, the broader project to try to image the magmatic plumbing beneath the Clear Lake volcanic field. So you can see that we've, we've cast a pretty wide net and we're really starting to fill in most of the gaps in our data coverage, but we still have some holes that we're looking to fill just to make sure that we don't have any kind of blind spots where we're, we're missing data coverage. Um, so you guys have been hugely helpful in filling in all of these holes. We really appreciate your interest and having the opportunity to work all of you to to make this happen. Um, next slide, please. Here are some preliminary uh, results from some of these MT inversions that we've done so far. Um, you see, so in this one, the blue areas are more resistive and the reddish colors are more conductive. And so underneath Cobb Mountain, you see this fairly bright or dark colored blue anomaly, which 
correlates with the geysers plutonic complex, which are these very resistive, intrusive igneous rocks that have mostly cooled beneath the geysers geothermal field. And then right across the Colomi Fault from that, underneath Mount Hanna, you see an area which is much more conductive. That's very close to that area where we were seeing the low density anomaly in the gravity results. And you see that this seems to be maybe part of a larger structure that is maybe extending out to the northeast as you move out towards Round Mountain in High Valley and up towards Wilbur Springs in that direction. So more work to be done on this, but initial results are like largely collaborate the corroborate the work that we did with the density and the gravity inversions. Um, but there's definitely a, an interesting anomaly out there to the northeast that we need to investigate further. Um, next slide, please. Here's just kind of a comparison of a bunch of different studies. Um, published this last year in the literature, we found a seismic study of this area that, and their inversion results are in the top panel. We have in the le top left, there's a, a P wave velocity, which is kind of a, a the speed at which compressional waves travel through the Earth. And then the upper right is a VS, or a shear wave velocity plot. Um, and so those, those particle motions are more of a shearing motion than a compressional motion for those waves. And you can just generally see there that there is a very large amount of agreement between where we see low seismic velocity anomalies and our low density body which is what you would expect if you had some sort of a, a fluid or a partial melt zone, those seismic waves are gonna travel slower through that partial melt than they would through solidified, hard, competent rock. Um, and then for comparison, there is the resistivity plot from our MT inversions in the bottom left there. Um, and that is kind of, that's showing a little bit less clear of a picture. It's kind of showing the area where we see the low seismic velocities and the low density is kind of maybe a transitional area on the border between the more resistive stuff that's beneath the geysers, all of those cooled plutonic rocks, and maybe something else that's more conductive extending in that northeastern trend um, from the Clear Lake area kind of up towards the Sutter Buttes area. So there's definitely some interesting things to kind of think about and unwrap there. And that's, that's really what we're focusing on going forward is finishing up this work with the MT inversions so we can really feel good about our um, MT inversions and those resistivity maps that we have there and then trying to integrate many of these different types of geophysical data in one joint inversion so we can get kind of one model out that can accurately explain and reproduce all of these different types of data. Because right now, there's just certain parts of the model that these individual um, geophysical inversions don't do a good job of constraining. So we're just trying to bring everything together and get as holistic of a view of it as possible. I think that may be it for me. Next slide, please. Yeah. All That's right. It for me. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's that time when everybody gets a little sleepy and we're in a dark room and it's cool. Um, I am going to talk to you a little today about the work that I'm doing which focuses on things that go boom. <laughs> so I work on the physical volcanology which is the eruptions on the surface and if you'll click on that slide one more time, hit the next. So. Physical volcanology is really often concerned with hazards. Volcanoes erupt, they're dangerous. Why do we care about hazards in Clear Lake? It's got pretty old volcanic rocks, except for the very youngest stuff. When you talk about volcanic rocks in the millions of years, you may not see that again in your lifetime. When you're starting to talk about volcanic rocks in the thousands of years old, there's a possibility that that might be activity we could see again in a human lifetime. So if you go to the next slide, why are we studying hazards? Uh, one of the youngest features in the Clear Lake volcanic field is this really interesting volcano called a mar. And mar comes from German word. It's very specific to a region uh, near the Eiffel area of, of Germany. And it is a word for a round crater lake. And they have a bunch of them there. And what they figured out is that this is a type of volcano that forms when you have magma rising to a shallow point in the earth 
and it hits groundwater. And magma is very, very hot. Water is much, much cooler than magma. If you put a hot thing into water, it's going to form steam and explode. And sometimes those explosions are violent enough that you actually form a crater. Now, you'll notice that these are pictures here that look a little bit like the Clear Lake area, but they are not. The top picture on the right side there is actually Lake Mivaten in Iceland. And the bottom one on the left there is, um, I believe, an example of one of the Mars in Italy. So we actually find these all over the world, but the same processes are happening. We're getting explosions very close to the level of the ground, or in this case, the level of Clear Lake itself, which has been here for a very, very long time. You have these eruptions that form when the water and the magma interact and explode, and you get a Mar volcano. And if you uh, are familiar with places like Soda Bay, Horseshoe Bay, all of those sort of scallopy places on the shoreline of Clear Lake, these are places where we have these Mar craters. So if you go to the next slide. So this is what a Mar eruption looks like from a sideways view. Um, this type of eruption usually lasts only a few days to a few weeks, so it's really short-lived in volcanic terms. It's actually, um, it is explosive, so it throws plumes of ash and rock, so volcanic ash is actually sand, it's not like burned ash, it's just pulverized rock. These can go up about five to ten miles in the air, so on a volcanic scale, not super big. Um, when you get deposits from these, when all this falls back down on the ground and sits there, you get um, also things like pumice. So pumice, if you've ever used a pumice stone on your feet, very frothy, very light, little, little popcorn-y looking thing. Um, that's because of all the gas and the steam that forms in these explosive eruptions. So you get these frothy pumice rocks. With these Mars, you're also ripping up rocks that are already there. Sometimes it's as the magma's rising through the earth. Sometimes it's because the crater that it's forming, you're throwing those rocks out of the crater. And so not only will you see the stuff we call juvenile, the new lava coming out, you will see bits and pieces of the rock that was already there, like the lava flows from Mount Kanaktai, or the Franciscan formation in Great Valley sequence, the sedimentary and metamorphic rocks that are already here. And the interesting thing about these Mar volcanoes is they're basically a one and done situation. They erupt once, they have maybe a few days or weeks where they have multiple explosions happening over and over and over again, but they don't erupt from that same crater. So Soda Bay is never going to erupt again, or if it does, it would be really, really unusual. Um, so these are volcanoes we call monogenetic, one genesis. So next slide. And this is what it looks like in real life. This is the eruption of uh, Eukindrik Mar in Alaska in the 1970s. And so you can see you've got that crater basically right at the ground surface. You've got a big old plume of ash. You can see all of that light stuff on the ground around the crater, which is maybe, I don't know, less than a mile wide, something like that. That's the ash and the rocks that are being thrown out during this Mar eruption. So next slide. Okay, again. Again, <laughs> we had some little animations. So, Clear Lake does have these young Mar volcanoes. And on the upper right there is a map with the topography, and you're not going to see any of the roads on there, but it's also got those little circles, which are where all of these Mars that we know about are located. Obviously, Soda Bay and Horseshoe Bay are very nice and rounded. They look like craters already but we've got Little Borax Lake right in the middle of the Buckingham Golf Course is actually a Mar volcano. And we think that there are more in Canoctai Bay and out along the Clear Lake Oaks area in the arm. And uh, pretty much anywhere that you see a scallopy shoreline, I get suspicious and think there might be a Mar there. So that's a beautiful shot from up on Buckingham Peak of that nice round crater in the golf course and then also off to the left where we have our base. So next slide. And this is what those deposits look like when they come out. Basically, if you've ever seen a person standing on the side of a road in a road cut staring at a wall of popcorn, 
that is a mar deposit. It has lots of these little pumice pieces in it, lots of little tiny chunks of the local rock that's come up, and it's very distinctly layered. So that one on the top left is actually from the bottom of one of the scoria cones up north of the lake, the, uh, one of the quarries that you've got for road material, and that started out as a mar eruption. So that's why it looks so light and sort of frothy looking. There's all those beautiful layers. So that area was wet when it erupted and can that magma came up through there. So we got a mar and then it became a scoria cone, made all those nice cinders that you might use in your landscaping. And there are a couple more examples from different areas, mostly on the uh, southwest side of the lake. There's beautiful layers there. You can see the popcorn on the bottom right next to that yellow notebook. And that is me pointing at a little layer of black material in the Mars. One of the ways that we can tell how old these Mars are is by finding organic material in the deposit. So not necessarily burned stuff, but that would be the idea. Little bits of plants, little bits of peat that come up from inside the lake or from the marshy bits of the area. And we can carbon date that because these Mars are so young to begin with. So next slide. So when we carbon date that, um, it's a similar method to the one that Seth uses to date much older rocks. You're depending on the decay of specific uh, forms of the atoms of carbon. Um, we find that the youngest Mars, so the ones up in the little red dots right there, years before present is on the left, and our youngest Mars are somewhere between 15,000 and 10,000 years, and we've actually got even some new dates. The youngest one is about 8,000 8, years old. So, as volcanologists, when things get to be younger than 10,000 years, we start paying attention. We say, this volcano is probably still active, might not be active in our lifetimes, but it is worth keeping an eye on. And we do keep an eye on the volcanoes here. We have monitoring systems, we have seismometers watching earthquakes, we watch whether the ground is moving up or down, and we also look at gases coming out of some of the areas like the uh, sulfur bank mine down the other end of the lake. So next slide. So you might ask, do we need to worry about these volcanoes? 8,000 years old is pretty young on a geologic time scale, uh, but the answer is, if you'll click again for me, right now, no. <laughs> we are not going to have a situation like these volcano disaster movies. Um, we do look very carefully at monitoring signals like I just mentioned, and the whole reason that we're out here doing these geologic assessments are basically like building up a medical history for the Clear Lake volcanic field. The more you know about someone's medical history, the better you can predict what might happen in your future. So if you have a medical history of heart attacks in your family, you know you want to take care of your heart health. And uh, we build up our history of the volcanic field, and then we also take the pulse with our monitoring. So the better we know our patient, the better we can predict when volcanic unrest might happen or is happening and means something important. So you shouldn't worry about it right now, but we are out here keeping a very close eye on things all the time. So next slide. So that is why we are out here building things like our hazard assessment. We are working on an interactive website with a map on it where you can actually learn about a lot of the different rocks and features of our field. We will be publishing some fact sheets soon that you could potentially uh, bring to your vineyards or your tasting rooms and have available for people. Um, we're here doing outreach, obviously. And we are going to continue to study these volcanic fields in the coastal areas of California because it's really important to know the full history of this progression of volcanism on our coast. But I'm talking to a lot of people who are interested in wine growing. So I threw a little bit in here. Being an East Coast girl, I thought I would try and tell you about your own profession, which is not something we do that much out here. And if you go to the next slide, um, I wanted to point out that our volcanic history here is really intimately tied to the viticulture that goes on. Your um, viticultural appellations are because you have these unique volcanic rocks and volcanic soils. And so I thought I would tie that back a little bit to the geologic map that we talked about briefly. So if you go to the next slide, um, terroir, you all know about it. Um, it's something that we don't think about a lot as geologists, but it really makes sense for us because the geology of a place really has strong controls on 
the topography, the shape of the landscape, and thus on the soils that you get in a specific place, the way the groundwater moves through it. All of these things are actually closer than we think about a lot of the time. Um, these are some basic connections that you can draw between the different things. The different rocks in this volcanic field obviously are going to affect whether it's appropriate to go grow grapes in a particular place and also what kind of grapes do best there. So next slide. So I pulled this from your wonderful website. It's a very beautiful depiction of all of your wine growing regions. Um, of these wine growing regions, the Big Valley, High Valley, Kelsey Bench, and Red Hills uh, regions are really the ones that have some volcanic influence involved. So if you'll go to the next slide, I thought I would pass through some of these. Your Big Valley area uh, laps up onto the slopes of Mount Kanaktai, which is our lava dome complex. These are dacite volcanic rocks, so they have a lot of silica in them. They're sticky and pasty when they erupt, and they're explosive. Um, but they are also right on the edge of this, you know, your broad valley with the sedimentary and metamorphic rocks underneath it. And so it's kind of interesting that you've got Mount Kanaktai there has created a topographic high that is shaping the climate and the, the valley that's formed in this area. And if you will go to the next slide, please. Kelsey Bench, we start to get into more of the lava flows and the pyroclastic or the explosive volcanic deposits from Mount Kanaktai. If you can see on the map there, you're starting to get into those purples and oranges. Those are rhyolites, which are a very, very glassy, silica-rich rock. Um, you've still got some of the alluvium. Um, you've got the Kelseyville formation, which has a lot more sandstone and mudstone. Um, so those are sedimentary, not necessarily affected by the volcanics. Um, but the next slide, you get into High Valley. And one of this, the really interesting features of High Valley is that it was basically dammed by a lava flow. So Round Mountain, you've got these lava flows which have cut off a drainage, a stream drainage, put in, um, you know, caused all of that alluvium, all of those sediments to gather there and made this into a really great region, obviously, to do some viticulture. Um, but that is one of the younger features, volcanic features, lava flows and escoria cone in the Clear Lake volcanic field. So that's something that we spend a fair amount of time looking at. And the next slide. And then, of course, we have Red Hills, which is really where we get into the heart of our volcanic field. Uh, it pretty much, as Seth said, spans the range of volcanic rocks from the really glassy silica rich ones all the way to the really magnesium and iron rich ones that give the Red Hills their characteristic red soils. So everything from rhyolite to basalt. And this is where we spend a lot of our time. Um, so you can see here you've got all these different colors from the geologic map. You've got faults all over the place. And so this is just a geologist's paradise and you'll see us out here quite a bit. Um, and then I think, if you go one more, all right, so we've told you a lot about what we do, but uh, what our success really depends on is working with you in this area. As, as Seth and Mike said, you know, you've given us this amazing access to things that we're studying. Um, and because we do work on hazards and we do work on how people live with volcanic eruptions and hazards like that, it's important for us to also ask you, you know, how can we work with you? What things would you need to know from our research that might be useful? If there ever were to be any kind of volcanic activity, what would you need to know? Um, volcanic hazards can have really big impacts on agriculture. And so that is why we are here as an observatory. We are here to help people deal with volcanic hazards. Um, and also, you know, who should, else should we be talking to? A lot of the time we go out and knock on doors or we see you at the side of the road or at a road cut, and that is a great way to make connections. But you know this land better than any of us do, and it's really important for us to learn from you um, when we're doing our work, where we can do our work, and how we can do a really good job at it. And I believe, if you go to the next slide, that is the end of it. Um, we are absolutely happy to take questions. We know you've thrown a lot of technical stuff at you. Um, 
we have our emails up there. We're always happy to get in contact with anyone. And uh, we are up here pretty much all the time, winter, summer. So if you see us, we love to chat. And I will stop there. I've got one question. I guess we pump water up to the geysers, uh, wastewater, I guess. Uh, what is that doing to volcanic activity potential, if anything? Volcanic activity, not much. Um, it's, there's not really any way for pumping water in the ground to affect a volcanic eruption. You need a lot of water, like you need a whole you know, subterranean lake, basically, for it to do something like create these mar volcanoes. Um, it does have effects on earthquakes. Um, water and faults can, can make them slip more easily. The geysers, they know, and they do have lots of little earthquakes all the time. It's also super well monitored. So the, you, when um, we do think about the hazards from that is when you're starting to maybe put a new geothermal well into a new area you haven't been before. It's kind of hard to figure out sometimes where the faults are, and if you hit a fault, you know, and put water into it that you didn't know about, that's when you might have to think about it. But volcanoes, not an issue. The, the main thing that they're doing there is they're replenishing all of the water and all the steam that they've pulled out of the steam reservoir since they started producing in the 70s. Because the, for the first 40 years, they just took steam and they've put hardly anything back. So in order to keep that field producing and to keep it a viable resource for producing electricity, they need to be putting water back in to produce more steam so that they can keep the cycle going. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, it's my turn. Yeah, um, the first one is you mentioned the, the Mars are a one and done thing, you know, monogenetic. Yes. And uh, it, I mean, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. You think of Soda Bay still underwater, so what if the magma comes again? So that's my, my first question. Right, right. So Soda Bay, um, as you know, was probably named because there's all this carbon dioxide coming out of it. Um, you can have an eruption and then still have heat and gas underground where that eruption happened and still have that bubbling. Super common. It is a faint possibility that you could have magma come up in that same spot, but I like to think of magma as lazy. It wants to take the easiest route to the surface. And if it can go somewhere else where there's not already a big old cold plug of cooled rock, it's gonna go around that. And since there's so many faults in the Clear Lake area, um, if we have another eruption, it's probably gonna be elsewhere along one of those faults. Gotcha, I get it from, from the plug. The other question is earlier in the presentation was mentioned that the uh, Santa Helena area, Mount Santa Helena and maybe Cobb also are three million years old versus uh, Clear Lake, Konoktai, Mount Hana are much more recent, and there might even be like a plume of the molten rock underneath, we don't know for sure. But my big question is that uh, that whole area in, uh, obviously it affects Sonoma and Napa, but also mi the middle town area, how would that affect the current uh, soil? You know, you mentioned all the, the volcanic properties for grape growing, so how about if you have an older volcano, what does it, what does it mean? Um, in general, it means that the soils are going to be better developed. Um, so the longer the volcanic rocks sit around, the longer they have to break down, turn it into something more soil-like than, than, you know, like gravel-like. Um, I'm not as familiar with viticulture as I should be. You'd probably want a soil scientist for that. It's Maybe Seth wants to take a stab. Uh, no, I think it's, it's dictated, you know, the... the the differences are led, if all other conditions are held the same, by time. How long do you have to develop the soil? But if all conditions aren't the same, like the composition of a rock is different between one spot and another, those rocks might be the same exact age, and you'd have very different soil profiles. So I think the nuanced differences between different soils is a result of time and also composition of the rock, where it's sitting, is it in a valley, is it up high, all those kinds of things. Thank you. Yeah. 
it has some potential for volcanic activity. But I would, you know, I would suspect that the gas removal systems at the geysers might alleviate some of that volcanic activity because you're moving all that gas out of the formation. Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, As yeah. Jess said, the, the, the activity, the pumping of water into the geysers doesn't represent some significant change to any volcanic system or the Correct. potential for, for volcanism. The, uh, the injection of water at the geysers is creating seismicity, mm -hmm. quite shallow, but it's not affecting the volcanic system or the, yeah, the, yeah. the potential for eruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I work at the geysers. Uh, but, but, but my question is, you know, since when, when they remove water, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to turn turbines, right, sure. they're also removing a lot of gas. Mm -hmm. so, so is that gas removal system at the geysers help? Because I, because, uh, because you're, you're, you're like alleviating pressure. Right. Um, so we've actually had people ask us this question about Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. So we all know that Yellowstone has geysers all over the place, big hydrothermal system, it's very active volcano. Um, people have proposed drilling and, and uh, starting up geothermal operations there as a way to release the pressure. Um, our human operations on, <laughs> on a volcanic system are so minuscule compared to the whole thing that it wouldn't have enough of an effect. Um, the forces and the amounts of gas involved are so huge. So, I mean, if you wanted to drill a million holes in it, you probably could remove enough of that water to have some effect, but in terms of an eruption, it's gonna happen whether or not you do something. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just curious, you go to work on Monday, things are changing. What kind of ominous signs <laughs> are you looking for that we need to sell our properties or whatever? <laughs> when, between the three of you, what are you looking what are you looking for that would indicate something bad? Oh, um, so that goes back to the monitoring. Um, so you look for little earthquakes happening in the ground. So imagine that you had a, a bit of magma rising. In fact, if any of you watched the news this morning, you might have seen the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii is erupting again. There's a lava lake forming at its summit. What they saw before that was tons of little earthquakes. And if you can figure out the three-dimensional position of those earthquakes, you can actually watch them rising from deep to shallow parts of the crust. You look for uh, changes in the level of the ground or the shape of a volcano. And this is something you can see with GPS. We actually have this big wide network of really, really sensitive GPS sensors, like the ones in your phone, but way, way better, that can tell us down to the inch how much the ground is moving, or if it's moving at all. Um, so when you shove magma up under the ground, it makes it swell. You can see it in these sensors. You can actually see it from satellite data. Um, and then we look for gas. So if you suddenly have you know, a mud pit or a steam vent pop up in the middle of a field, that's a good reason to get suspicious. Um, this is something that happened in um, the 1940s in uh, Mexico at Pericutine Volcano, the volcano in a cornfield. If any of you watched uh, Reading Rainbow a long time ago, they actually had an episode about this. This poor corn farmer, you know, saw these ground cracks form in his field, and the next thing he knows, there's steam coming out, there's lava being thrown into the air, and suddenly he's got a, you know, 500 foot high volcano in his, cor in his cornfield. So I would look for, you know, change, if you're suddenly seeing steam coming out of the ground where there wasn't any before, big ground cracks that can't be explained by a drought, lots of earthquakes, and um, all of these are things that we would look at if we were going out to evaluate it. And we are happy to hear from people who are noticing unusual things. We've come out of here a few times for folks who've been feeling earthquakes in their, on their properties or you know, they see ground cracks that they're suspicious about. That is part of our jobs is to come out and look at it, see what it is, reassure you hopefully that nothing is going to happen. Scare you to death and then put you in touch with our realtors. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Really be a quick one, but talking about the seismic activity induced by the activity at the geysers, mm -hmm. last Thursday, 5 a.m., 
there was a 4.4 magnitude earthquake no, nine miles north of Geyserville. So this type of mag magnitude, is this uh, possible? It's the geysers or it's something else? It is, yes. It's not the usual. Most of the, mag of the earthquakes of the geysers are something like magnitude three or below. You really can't feel them that well unless you're nearby. But it's not uncommon to see those magnitude fours. A couple a year probably they get Yeah, a them. couple a year. Um, if we saw a bunch of them all at once, then we would start being concerned. But uh, the way that the larger earthquakes work, if they get big enough, not only do you have the initial earthquake, you also have more little pops afterwards as the ground adjusts itself. So it's not unusual to get these little swarms of them from time to time. What's the Franciscan complex? I saw uh, that a few oh. times. Sorry, we use that term a few times. Uh, so it is rocks that were formed by the, um, all of those tectonic forces that you saw sort of squishing and deforming and shoving California northward. Um, there are things like serpentinite, so those really shiny green rocks you see out there. Um, there are cherts, so if you see you know, that's sort of jasper is the common name, these really red, blocky pieces of rock. Um, there are even these sort of dirty sandstones in there. They're called gray wacky. Um, but it's all stuff that has been crunched up and heated up and basically changed from what it originally was. And um, you might see five or six different kinds of these things in the same area. Um, but yeah, if you see anything that looks blue or green on the ground, that's probably Franciscan complex. I have a good analogy for this. <laughs> you got a subduction zone where one plate is being shoved beneath the other. Think about having a piece of bread with a bunch of peanut butter on it, and you've sprinkled, uh, I don't know, raisins and olives and pecans on that peanut butter, and then you shove the piece of bread down beneath the table, and all that stuff piles up against the edge of the table. That is what California's coast is made of. These volcanoes have erupted through that and onto that. Yeah. So it's a whole bunch of different rocks, yeah. like Jess said, all juxtaposed against each other in a matrix of stuff that was scraped off the ocean floor. Yeah. You might also hear it called melange, which melange. is geologist speech for this is a mess and we don't know what all is in it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Good oh, we have one more question. Um, Mount Kanakdai Volcanic, Mount St. Helena Volcanic, Mount Hannah Volcanic, yep. Round Mountain Volcanic. What about Snow Mountain up north? Ooh. No, not volcanic. Snow Mountain uh, is a bunch of rocks within the Franciscan Formation. I'm almost certain it might be the Great Valley Sequence. Those are two big, um, like 120 to 80 million year old uh, basement rocks that have been uplifted along the major regional faults in this area. Yeah, so Snow Mountain not made of volcanic rock, but uplifted by the same processes that have uplifted Mount St. Helena, for example. Please join me in thanking Michael, Jessica, and Seth. Um, about a year ago, we were having a strategic planning meeting at the commission office during a board meeting, and I, uh, the group was talking about this group that was doing these pruning classes online and how most of the board members have actually been trying to watch these videos in Italian, trying to figure out what they've been saying and understand the processes and stuff. And that conversation kind of morphed into, well, maybe we should try to have these guys come out and actually teach us their their philosophies and how they design, how they want us to prune the vineyards. So uh, we pretty much, we, after that meeting, we went out after getting a grant and a couple other things. We reached out to Simon Eck and Search to bring them to our region to teach them their uh, method of pruning. Yes, and the commission became the first regional organization to partner with Simon Eck and Search as the Vine Master Pruners class came to Lake County. Uh, the class uh, uh, launched uh, last November and wrapped up about two weeks ago with their last suckering class. Um, we're eager to share with you a little bit about the class 
and in the impl implement implementation of the Lake County uh, vineyards. Uh, obviously, as always, Jacopo and Jacopo and Jet will be answering questions after um, the uh, they're, they're after them speaking. So let's go and get started and bring them up here. And thank you very much. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Well, so my name is Jacopo Miolo. Here I have my workmate, Jet Johansson. And uh, we work for, don't worry, we, everyone is going to mispronounce this name, is Simonita and Cirque, but it's not a problem. So we had the first edition of the Lake County Pruning School. So what we did in, during this Lake County Pruning School, well, we had, uh, of course, online courses, as uh, they mentioned before, but what we did and uh, what we like to do so much is, next, please, uh, is uh, uh, two days during the winter, one day during the spring of tutoring. What does it mean? That is a time, you know, it's a moment for all the viticulturists of the Lake County to work together, sharing uh, and learning uh, a pruning method uh, based on 30 years of experience, okay? But it's not just about learning, but it's also, please next, <coughs> uh, a work as a team. So we like to think about the pruning and uh, also about the, this pruning school like a team activity that we can do all together. Anyway, what is the Simonite and Silk Bruning method and uh, uh, what, what does it mean? So, Simonite and Silk Bruning method started, let's say, more than 30 years ago from the idea of Marco Simonite and Pierpaolo Sirk. That what they did, they started to look at the vines and what was going on at that time. So, we are speaking about the 90s, more or less, in Italy. And uh, what they started to see is, uh, and to think about, is the pruning consequence inside the structure of a vine. Next, please. So, what do we have inside uh, the trunk? And, uh, you know, if you everyone here knows how is done a vine, right? We have a, co a trunk, and after, if we speak about a cordon, we have two arms with the position. If we speak about a cane, we have trunk with two canes or more canes, it depends how much grapes do you want to produce. Anyway, what they started to, to think about, okay, what is going on inside? Because we can see what is going on outside, looking about how, about how is the growing the canopy. We can, know, we can know how it's going with the fertilization yeah. and all this kind of stuff, studying the soil. Here we have just the geologists that explain us many things. But no one before these two guys thought about, okay, what is going on inside the trunk? What they did? Well, at that time, they cut off some vine from the vineyard and they brought the, the vines to a carpenter and they made cross-section of the vines. And what they discovered is, next please. These are those actual vines. Yeah. So what they started to see is, okay, now we did this cross-section, what we can see. Let's try to do this together. Well, inside the vine, what we can see is that we have par part of the wood that has this white color and part of the wood that, is, uh, that has this brown, blackish color, okay? And they figured out that these this white wood and this darker wood is nothing more than that live wood and dead wood. And what they notice is that also the dead wood was always where there were any kind of wound. So as we can see, for example, on the first plant there, we have our trunk, we have the head, this is a single guillot, and on the top of the head what we can see, all this pruning wood that was made in the past because over here we go to prune the vine here by here. Inside what they found, they found that where there are all these pruning woods, inside there is a lot of dead wood. Where? Usually on the trunk, where usually we do not have any pruning wound because 
we should train or we suckle during the, the growing season, that part of the plant, we, are, we have a lot of wild wood. So there, there they understand, okay, so this dead wood is coming from the pruning, from the wounds. Okay? So, and they gave a name to this, and is, please next. They called desiccation cones. Is it a disease? No, not at all. It's the natural way that the plant has to close its wounds. Okay? So it's not a disease. Simply, easily, we have to think about the trunk as a, uh, a water pipe. Okay? Of course, not just one, but many all together. What happens? Every time that we remove a part of the vine with the pruning, the plants need to close the water pipes that wor were bringing water up to that part. And how the plant does this? Creating these desiccation cones. What they see also, what they saw at the time, is that this one was more frequent, so all this concentration of wounds was more frequent in the newer vineyards than not in the older vineyards. Why? Different and labors. Anyone have a clue? Yeah, they do not have a clue. But after <laughs> what they started to do is to travel around Europe, and what they saw that in the oldest vineyards that we have in Europe, so south of Italy, Spain, Portugal, the training system and the idea behind the pruning was completely different. Than so in the modern one. Sorry, what? Than in the modern vineyards. Than in the modern viticulture. So, uh, but let's try to figure it out uh, to make an example here in the United States. Do you know Lodi? Yeah? You know that uh, is one of the biggest AVA here in the, in the United States. It's not maybe the bigger, but anyway. And uh, there, there are one of the most, the oldest vineyards that we have here in the United States, 120 years old. Which, what is the training system there? It's not Guyot or Cane, it's not Cordon, but it's head train vine. Another difference is the spacing between the vines. So at that time, when they planted that vineyards, the space between the vines were eight feet by 10, 10 by 10, so really wide space. S in the modern viticulture, how is? It's different. First one, we have wires, posts, we have the rows, we have geometries in our vineyards. Space between the rows, space between the vines, that is, every here is always, you know, it seems that there is a kind of competition. Ah, oh, I planted three by three. Ah, oh, I planted two by two. It yeah. seems. <laughs> it's the only, <laughs> the only moment when, you know, you try to be shorter than not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, of course, this change in the vineyard brought changing also in the pruning method. Because of course, if in a head trained vine we have a lot of space to make the plant develop, okay, to grow in the space, in the modern viticulture we do not have all this space. Or better, we have many mind, mind limits yeah. saying, oh, I can't go over the wire. I can't grow too much with my position because if not, I'm gonna lose canopy. Is it this right? Yeah, more or less. We have more limitations <coughs> in so modern viticulture. Their question was, why we have vineyards that are 80 years old, 100 years old, that are still there, still producing a good amount of grapes, and with the modern viticulture or the technology, tractors, chemicals, knowledge, we have to pull out the vineyards after 20 years, or 15 or 25, depends, you know, where you are, how is the climate. Well, they figured out something. Next slide, please. Next again. And here we can say that was the spark that made everything happen. Next. They understood one thing, that the vine is a creeper. So it's not like a tree, it's a plant that likes to grow in the space, to, to climb extend. the trees, extend 
It's not a plant that likes to stay in one place. So in the past, our you know, grand grandfathers were able to handle this nature of the vine doing what? Next, please. Try to simulate what was, going, what was going on in the nature artificially. So this is an example of a vineyard that is under more than 100 years old in south of Italy. Maybe, As it's, huh? maybe it's 500 years old or something like that. I don't know. I do not remember. Like we have to ask one, them. This one, very, very old. Yeah, for sure older than us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> As we can see, what is the structure of the vine? It's similar to what we saw before, no? The only difference, they change it. There are not any more trees. There are just these boot posts. But what we're doing, our grand-grandfathers, was more or less what they saw in the nature. In different ways. Next slide, please. You know, hatred vines is the most natural way to manage a vineyard. Do we have wires here? Post? Nothing. There isn't any geometrical limit. So what their idea was, okay, how, what we can do to take this idea and apply this to the two most used training system in the world, so cordon and cane or guyot. Next slide. Oh, this is another. It's really nice. Isn't it? It's beautiful. Uh, Switzerland? Probably Switzerland. Yeah. yeah. Next, please. So, the question was, okay, we have this, these vines that are 120 years old. Why they are so old? Because in some way, the, the, the workers, our grandfathers, let the plant create this structure. What do we have in a high trade vine? We have the trunk, we have a, uh, an head, and after from this head, we can have you know, four, five, six, seven, eight branches, arms that are going like an octopus. The question was, okay, so we understand that if we let the plant grow a little bit here by here, as we can do on the head train vines, the plant is able to uh, live for longer. It's also in a healthier way than not as what they were seeing at that time. But what we can do to bring this idea from a head train vine to the cordon and to the cane system? Well, here they started to think, well, we have to create a method of work. The method that is called Simonit and Sig pruning method. So next, please. The first rule, uh, the Simonet and Sig pruning method, and we wrote also books about this, is based on four easy rules, not easy, simple rules. Simple, okay? So the first one is controlled branching. What does it mean? What we do on a head train vine? Here by here, we, with our spurs, we grow we let this position create this arm. Okay, what can I do with the, for example, here we have an example of a double cane. Okay, I can't create six, seven arms. What I can do, I can develop two arms. So I have my trunk and my two arms. That here by here they go to grow in this way. Oh, in the draw is beautiful. Is it possible in the reality? Next slide. Yes, it is. The drawing is a copy of the picture. Yep. <laughs> so, as, as we can see here, we have an example of that is totally different of what we saw before. Before, we were looking at a trunk with a head full of wounds, and that is. Here, we have a trunk that is always the main structure of the vine, but from this trunk, we have these two arms that are growing outside where we are able, here by here, to grow a little bit. Why is it so important to grow for the vine? Because, as I said, it's a creeper. So it needs to grow to increase his am its amount of life uh, inside. Next. 
we can do this one in different ways. I want to have two arms, I can do with two arms. I can do also with one, one single cane just with one arm. Next. Same thing about the cordon. Of course, here we, do, we are not speaking about canes, eh? but here by here, what we can do is to rise a little bit my position. How much we are speaking? One finger, less than a half inch. This picture is from... Uh, uh, yeah. You this picture is from our uh, campus in northern Italy where they have been uh, experimenting with this method since uh, they started doing those uh, cross-sections of the plant. So this is the result of 30 years of uh, application of uh, the Simonita Siak method. Of course, when, we, when they started, they did some mistake, eh, Stoma. They, they, they were trying to create this method. So, Usually here the people ask to us, ah, but if I grow so much, if I raise so, so much my position, I'm going to lose canopy. Well, you can edge the bean a little bit higher. It's not a big deal. But what we can see here, look at the evenness growth of the, sh of the canes, of the shoots, sorry. Anyway, next slide. So the first rule of our method is controlled branching. So let the plant grow in the space how we want. But always with the idea to increase the amount of livelihood. Second rule is jet. To respect the vascular flow of the plants, the, the, which is the way the sap runs through the main structure of the plant until it reaches the shoots that then are you know, that's what produces our grapes and the leaves and everything that we need on the plant. Yep. So, of course, we need that vascular flow of the plant to be as healthy and intact as possible. Why this is so important? What is, at the end, the trunk of the vine? It is the connection between the roots and the canopy. If uh, the connection is working well, my canopy will be healthy and I, can, I can get a good crop from it. If my connection is not working, I can start to see some, you know, struggle, like short shoots, dead positions. Loss of vigor. Lo yeah. So, pick next please. Next again. So here we have an example. So the second rule is based, as uh, we said, on the respecting of the uh, vascular flow. Here we have an example. This is a Cabernet Sauvignon from Bordeaux. And it's not a plant, it's not a plant that we work with. It's just a... Uh, yeah, this is... You out know, of pure chance, this is the way they've been working the plant, right? So they do, by themselves, they, they develop these two arms. But on one side, what we have is... We have, on the left side, we have an arm where we were able to left all the pruning wounds on the top part of the arm. In the right side, is it right? Yes. We have the pruning woods. Yeah, we were able to create this arm, but we have these pruning woods more or less everywhere. They cross each other. Right? Exactly. So, next slide, please. What we can see. Okay, let's start from the left. On the left, now we know the difference between live wood and dead wood, right? Perfect. On the left, we can see that from the base of the trunk to the end of the arm, we have a kind of highway there. No? We have a kind of, you know, an highway. interrupted road. An yeah. interrupted road that connected the roots with the cane on that side. The other side, what we can see? Well, on the trunk, we have uh, the road, but after we have some accident, you know, we started to have some traffic around. Potholes. Yeah, some crazy guy. So it's really important to try to create on a vine, um, and we need to be careful about this, a preferential way, uh, an interrupted way for the sap to reach the canopy. So here is, of course, clear. For in the left side, we did it. 
On the right side, we don't. We didn't. No, we did it. We didn't. On the, on the left side, we did it. And the, on the right side, we didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Next, please. <laughs> Here we have another example. This is, you know, this is a winery that we have been worked together. Is a, as you can see, is a Chardonnay 1990, planted in 1993. And at the beginning was pruned in the, we call traditional way. So the idea to keep the vine always there. With uh, the lopper. So here it says head pruning, but, but uh, in Europe that's what we call it. But it's when we prune the, the vine like, um, what's it called, the uh, willow. You know, mm -hmm. we cut everything off and we take one shoot every year. But about these details, you can find more information in the books. Anyway, <laughs> here, as you can see, what we did, we converted this vine from the traditional pruning to the simonite and silk pruning method. So we found a uh, an, an, an interrupted way to create our harm. So what does it mean, this? That also if we prune in a, in a traditional way in the past, what is always possible to learn. So in this one was the goal this year of the Lake County Pruning School. Try to learn something different. Try something different because we, in this, especially in the wine industry, there is always something to learn. Next, please. Oh, this is another example. This is the first vineyard that Marco Simonit started to work in uh, in Italy. So at the beginning it was a uh, head, head pruning vine, so with many prunes on the head. And after he developed these two arms. This is a 45 years old vineyard that is still there, is still producing. You can understand that also speaking about you know, money and investment. If, I am, if I'm able to keep my vineyard as long as I can, better it is. Because I can split my initial investment for a longer period. And I can get also more money back. Next. So the third rule is it's more technical, of course. So any time that we are going to uh, prune a water, uh, sucker or a, or a shoot, we have to be careful to reduce, in the best way possible, the size of the wound that I'm going to create. So we have to be careful to make small wounds. So when we are going to cut a one-year hold with, so it could be a sucker, could be a shit. What we have to do? Next, please. Here we are going really technical, huh? so stay with us. What we have to do? We have to, before we need to start to understand what is the morphology of the vine. So here we have just a zoom of a uh, uh, shoot, is that reddish part where we have the, our scissor. At the base of every shoot, we have what we call the basal buds or the crown buds. Someone calls basal buds, someone calls uh, crown buds. Why we have to be careful? Because when we go to cut a shoot like this, we need always to leave these basal buds. And now we are going to explain you why. Next, please. So here we <coughs> have a cross section of a shoot. This one is a live plant though. Yeah. It's not dry like the other ones we saw. So here we have the shoot. Here we have the, could be the trunk, could be the head, could be the cane, doesn't matter. So what we can see, next slide, please. At the base, we have the base buds. Next slide. If you're going to make, oh, too much, a little bit less, little bit, OK. Next, next. Next. There we Stay are. Stay there. Thank you. So when we are going to make, uh, when we are going to prune the vine and we are going to remove this shoot, it's important to keep the base buds. If we are able to keep these base buds, what happened? Next slide, please. Of course, we create a wound, so the plant is going to create a desiccation cone. Natural reaction of the vine is not a disease. Okay. But no. Go ahead. Yeah. Stay there. OK, perfect. Stay there. Uh, one more. OK. There we go. So the fact that we left there the, ba the base buds, so the base buds, what they do usually? They call the sap. So we have something that is working, that is still alive there, 
that it is continuing to call the SAP and is able to keep the desiccation cone smaller and just located in that area. But what, what happens if we don't keep, or if we don't keep, yeah, if we don't keep the base buds? Next, please. Yeah, no, subflow, bell. Next. Next. Base buds, we know where are. Okay, perfect, next. Okay, so what happens if we go to remove? So we go to make a really clean cat. No, really clean, no base buds. We do not want to have suckers during the spring, not too much. Well, so we much won't work. have any suckers if we remove them. Of That's course. one of the things. That'll so happen. this is one of the traditions, no? What they say to us, you know, at school or the first day that we work in the vina, if you're going to, if you see something on the trunk during the winter, go and make a really clean cat. So no base buds, nothing. Smooth. Yeah. You could even <laughs> sand it off with some sandpaper, get it really nice and smooth. And someone did it. Next. So, of course, first thing, the size of the fund will be bigger. So the desiccation cone, too. Bigger is the wound, bigger is the desiccation cone. It's a natural reaction. Next. Of course, we do not have any more bud that is continuing to call the sap. So that part is going to die completely. Is it this true? Next, next. The only way, because we are not doctors, so what we like to do is to try the things, see if it's true, okay, it works. After we speak also with the professors that help us to convalidate this. Here is an example of a trial that we did uh, in, uh, in Italy. So in a young Venus, we left all the suckers, and on the left side, we remove all the suckers keeping the base of us. On the right side, we talk out, we make smooth and clean cuts to remove the base buds. What is the difference that we can see? First one, start is always from the left. The desiccation cone, the black, the black spot is small and located just there. But what we can see, we can see that the live wound was able to close that wound, so that part is healed. It's On protected from water, from Disease, disease, trunk diseases. It's closed in there. Right side, what we have is uh, the side where we left always, you know, we made always clean cut. What we can see, first one, the desiccation cone is bigger. Second thing, is not just located in that area. We can see that is the that black stripes are continuing to going down. Because, of course, the plant is continuing to try to keep this desiccation cone there. Next, last but not least, protective wood, or we call it spare wood, usually, with yeah. the guys in the vineyards. What does it mean? Of course, there are some time we need to cut and to remove some part that, the, that is a little bit older that one year. So if you speak about cane, it could be two years. If we can speak about the trunk, could be who knows what, how much. Could I ask you a question? Yes, could we please. recap the three rules that we went through? What they're or called? Do you want to ask to, uh, to them? <laughs> yeah. Is there anyone here that could recap the first three principles that we talked about for, nah. for Maybe. Um, using <laughs> the <laughs> pruning method? No, well, 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 well. that's fine. They are shy, you know. It yeah. So the first rule we said, now this is the fourth. The first rule is control branching. Second rule is respecting the vascular flow. Third rule is small wounds or small cuts as you watch. The last one, but not the least, is protective wood or spur wood. Why is it so important? Because we understood every time that we make a wound, we create a desiccation cone. Bigger is the wound, bigger is the desiccation cone. So when we go to cut a wood that is a little bit older than one year, could be two, three, four, five years, of course the size of the wound, the wound increased a lot. So what we do, next slide, as we can see here, we need to remove that cane. We are doing quite a big wound, not so much, but it's biggish. It's bigger, yeah. What we do, we are not going to make to put to make this wound to make this cut close to our vascular system or 
our highway, let's call it this way, but we're going always to keep this, you know, amount of spur wood that helps, you know, to keep further the desiccation cone from my main road. It's like a fire, uh, you fire know, in the, in the forest, y you, dig, you can dig trenches or you can make a fire, you can clear some forest to yep. keep the fire from spreading, right? Yep. So, next. Whenever you want. And we made also research about this. Now, I'm not going to be too, too deep on this. But what we discovered is that if we are going to make the wounds keep in this amount of spur wood or not, there is a big change. If we're going to make these wounds without any spur wood, of course, the desiccation cone is directly there. And it goes deeper inside than not if we keep amount of spur wood. Next. So, really, really interesting, beautiful, the four rules, but our goal at the end is to try to recover that knowledge that we lost in some way from the people that well, were you know, managing the vines as a head trained vines and applying this idea to the modern viticulture. On, of course, on the cane, but also, next slide, on the cordon. Leaving the, trying to follow a little bit more what is the nature of the vine and try to follow a little bit less what we think about geometry. Okay? Because the goal is if I can keep my vine for a long, for a long time, what I can do is better grapes, better wine, but also grapes cut for a longer time. Cut down on investment costs. Okay? So, next. Well, as I said, we wrote books about this, blah, 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 that's explained but in a better way for sure. Oh, uh, they're very detailed. Really detailed, yeah. But they're not too boring, don't worry. Uh, what does it mean, the pruning method, how to apply this? But this is just an educational tool that we developed. What our goal is try to share our knowledge with the people. Okay, for this, this year with the Lake County Wine Grape Commission, we started this program. So, and yeah, it's the first one in the United States. And I hope that it will not be the last one. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're gonna make sure uh, that we'll, we'll do schools in other parts of uh, California, yeah. at least for now. Because what we think, and that is really important, is uh, that also the people, you know, there is a lot of knowledge in winemaking, in viticulture, in, uh, you know, geology, but there is a, a lack of knowledge and training, especially for the people that work every day in the vineyards. So, the Mexican guys... To make guys that connection between yeah. the, the knowledge that's there, it's available, and the people applying the knowledge in the work situation. Exactly that at the end are, are these people that are handling our vineyards or your vineyards. Are these people that are, you know, deciding if your vineyards will stay, your vine will stay there for a long time or for a short time. So what we, the program that we developed with the, the Lake County has this goal to train the people and to think in a different way that can help also the Lake County wine region, okay? Anyway, next, I don't think, well, we have different Guyot, Cordon. Any question? No. Oh. Well, we also have the online tool. Yeah, 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 but we can speak about this another time. All right. So, if there, is no, if there aren't any questions. Yeah. Looking at the sucker cut versus the big cut, and you said it closed the wound on its own. How long did it take for that wound to close? To uh, close. Mm. Hmm, this is a good question. So, uh, when it depends on how we did that cut, okay? 
So if we did uh, the cu that cut on, uh, you know, keeping the base above, speaking of one year hold shoot, it takes one year to close, one, two years. Depends also in the vigor of the vine and how much energy it has the vine. More vigor we have in the vine, more is able to handle all the stress that we create. And it'll grow quicker. Yeah. If we don't do, if we don't keep the base above, usually that wound will never close. We will always see this, you know, spot. Some old farmers say, uh, the vine remembers. Always. Yeah, this is the interesting, interesting thing about this work, now working with the vines, especially with the pruning. Whatever we do now is something that we can see on the vine after 20 years. Is like, you know, a book, a diary. Other questions? I, I, did I answer to your question? You're welcome. There is another one here. Yes. It looked like at first when you were showing the cuts that you were making the cuts to where the arm itself was creeping out. But then later in the photos, it looked like um, if that you that was a different type of pruning and you were still laying down a cane and then letting the spurs develop. So were those two different types of pruning? Because at first I thought you were making cuts to make the arm expand, but then later I saw sh a young vine that looked like you did just lay down the cane and then applied your principles to the spurs. Oh yeah, yeah, you're speaking about different uh, training system. Yeah, the, f the first one that we saw uh, was um, a long pruning, what we call long pruning. So there are two different kind of pruning in the world, short pruning and the long pruning. On the long pruning, we have always a cane, so a long shoot that we left during the winter that carries the production of the year. Short pruning are all that uh, training system where we are working just with spurs, so with a short um, par part of a shoot with two free buds, depends how long we are going to leave these spurs, that are carries our production. Okay, so about speaking about the short pruning, we can have different kind of training system. We can have uh, uh, cordon, double cordon, uh, California sprouting, uh, head train vines. Speaking about the uh, long pruning, we can have uh, guillot, double guillot, uh, quad cane, um, double arch, blah, blah, blah. There are many ways. But mainly there are two different kind of pruning, long pruning and short pruning. Other questions? Nope. They could also be mixed. Yeah. You know. Oh, well, yeah, but <laughs> no, step like by step. If you, you, have a, you have a cane and a spur. Yeah, but if yeah. we say to them that there is some training system to make, you know, 15 tons per acre. <laughs> 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 okay, so, oh, yeah. Maybe you can mention something about the... <coughs> as far as changing the vigor versus how many visible buds you leave, so if you have a big difference um, in your growth on your vine if you have really short uh, shoots versus really long shoots, how you can balance that by, by your pruning method. Hmm. I would like to add uh, something before that. Mm -hmm. Why is a problem to have a long shoot and a shorter shoot? What is the question? What is the, what is the problem behind this? What the lady said? Huh? Harvesting. Harvesting? could be that one too. But mainly, let's focus on the grapes. So if we have a long shoot, if we have a position or a shoot that is healthy, that is able to uh, grow a lot, to, uh, to be really tall, of course this shoot is also able to carry a lot of grapes, at least two clusters, and quite big. Depends on the variety, of course. Sometimes also three if we speak Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc too. If we have a short shoot, it means that it is a weak shoot. Less leaves. Less leaves. The clusters are smaller. Maybe the amount is always the same. Could be we can have always three clusters. But one thing is to have one cluster like this. Another thing is to have one cluster like this. Speaking also about this. What is possible to do to balance this? We uh, just finished two weeks ago the shoot thinning, the suckering. Yeah. 
And there, but I'd like to explain this to Jet. What we did, Jet, during the shoot thinning. Well, uh, to understand what we did during the shoot thinning, we have to understand what we did during the pruning as well. Ah, that's true. But just very quickly, we looked at the plants and we decided to, through our pruning, also leave a message to the shoot thinning crew, which in this case are ourselves, that we came back after the pruning school in the springtime, where if we saw that the, the, that position of the plant was strong, it was growing and pushing strongly, we'd leave a longer spur. So we'd cut that, that shoot, we'd cut it, leaving it a little bit longer. So you can clearly see, okay, this one is strong. And where the plant was uh, growing weaker, it was showing signs of weakness, you know, short, uh, short shoots, not many leaves, very uh, thin shoots, we'd leave a shorter spur so that whoever's coming along there suckering will see, all right, here, this is where the plant is strong, this is where the plant is weak, this is a strong plant, this is a weak plant. Uh, and they could see that because when you're suckering, it's not easy to understand the vigor of the plant, while when you're pruning, it's quite a lot easier. So we have to think about the pruning, and we said this before, the plants, a plant never forget, okay? So we have to figure it out that it's like a story that every pruning and every spring we are going to write. So what we did during the pruning is a consequence of what we did during the previous season. What we are doing, what we did two weeks ago during the suckering is a consequence of what we did during the last pruning. What we, the, this harvest, it will be a consequence of what we did during the, during the suckering and during the shoot and during the pruning. So what we do, did we do during the suckering there? On the positions that we deemed strong, we would leave more shoots. In this case, in the school, we left two shoots where the positions were strong, where we left a longer spur. And in the positions that we deemed weak, where there was a shorter spur, we left one shoot. Just. And this way we can balance the vigor of the plants. Yep. Other questions? No? All right, well, we'll oh. find the next panel up along with uh, Dr. Bo and Jed. It was a time to have a Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Madonna. Congratulations. So I expect to have everybody attend the class and learn uh, what we're talking about here, because the visuals sometimes are better in the field than in, in the classroom setting, okay? Um, with the next year's class, we're still working out, there'll be the, it's in English and in Spanish, but also there is probably going to be a different level or a different style of pruning that we might be talking about in next year's classes. Yep. We're still trying to work those details out. Um, if you want more information, you can call the Wine Grape Commission office, or you could just email events at lakecountywinegrape.org to get more information or to sign up. Okay, now with that, my first question is gonna be to y'all two over here. Um, how are we as students? Do you feel like we actually learned from what you're trying to teach to us? Or did we get a passing grade here? Uh, were we successful in learning your style out in the field? Well, I'd like to answer to this question <laughs> on uh, Professor Jett. Absolutely, I think. Uh, uh, most, if not all, the people who attended the school, uh, we've got uh, good feedback and I think everyone really appreciated it. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of discussion in all the classes, right? It's oh. questioning to understand, right? It's Debate. To, yeah, yeah. So you guys over here now, did you, were you excited to see what you saw and what did you actually take from what they were teaching from us and how did you apply it to your vineyards? Chris, you want to start off, or Bruce, or Tony? <laughs> the real take-home message for me was the desiccation cones. I think the root of all our pruning issues is from that. So any anything that came out of that was how do we mitigate those, and that's what I took home, yeah. be it on our older Cabernet vines or the young Savion Blanc vineyard that we're in the process of developing right now. It's uh, creating that or protecting that vascular flow via mitigating that desiccation cone. 
seasons ago and uh, you know I came home one day after painting for a few weeks and I was like you know I really want to learn more I want to know kind of more of the science yeah because it, it fills in some gaps and uh, I looked online and this was before they had even come here or anything like that I went to Terry one of our vineyard owners and I said I want to take this class and she's like hold on <laughs> just hold on because you know we might try to you know do this so I studied up uh, little bit of biology in my first year of college, so it made, made a lot of sense. To right. Me. So, I know we have some of those problems that we saw on the screen in our vineyard that I want to try to stop from happening from previous pruning and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, yeah, it just made a lot of sense for me. And we're doing that. We're a very small vineyard, and we're doing that across. We've already pruned 100% uh, of our vineyards. Yeah, yeah. So, Tony, um, I mean, I think you even brought a vine from your own vineyard. I don't know if you dug it up or if it was a dead vine. and brought it in kind of saying, this is my vine, what do you do? So, I mean, how, obviously you brought a vine, so obviously you brought the technique back to your staff, or how did they kind of receive all that? I brought a vine over because I was taught a different way of pruning back from when my dad was working there. Coming to the class, I kind of to see me were doing it somewhat different than what I was taught in the class. But the plant had a lot of dead wood, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. And it was from doing all these close cuts to the vines and everything that I was taught before. Yeah. And then seeing this new system that we got going on. So I think, what? yeah, we're, we were all from the same school of thought. We're yeah. In right. our training, you know, it was, like Jet was saying, almost with the sandpaper, we're going to make that trunk clean, and we're going <laughs> to keep those cuts yeah. tight. <laughs> and, uh, it's quite a contrast to get your head around, but once you see the principle behind it, uh, it's quite it's logical to make the change. So, uh, just to give the crowd a understanding of where you're working and how many vines you actually touch, um, how many vines do you typically sucker or prune every year, and how big is the crew that you work with? Chris, <laughs> uh, Cat's Paw, we're a small uh, boutique vineyard of uh, Merlot Cabernet and uh, Petit Syrah. Sell our grapes, organic grapes, to uh, Chase Water. Um, we have about seven acres, so uh, we're fortunate that we can immediately um, put this pruning method into use mm -hmm. um, this season because uh, I'm pretty much the farm worker, <laughs> so uh, yeah, buzz helps out a lot. As well. <laughs> but uh, so we're able to do that, so we're kind of an interesting test case. Yep. Tony. I come from uh, Cash Creek and I manage their uh, 76 acres. And I took this class and this technique back to our like 25 acres of our plants that we have there. From Civium Blanc to Mel, uh, Melbach, Petit Verdot, and Syrah mm -hmm. that we have out there. And um, my wife and I farm up on the Kelsey bench. We have a bit over 30 acres right now. We'll be touching 40 soon. Um, Cabernet that's planted in 2015 and then Sav Blanc planted last year and then Cab Franc and more Sav Blanc this year but um, back on those desiccation cones uh, the Cab yeah that was treated old school way um, those tight cuts and then uh, so almost a rehabilitation of those vines is what where we're going with those crown cuts um, and then on the Savion Blanc the young vines getting that trained up there and from word from start they're going to have a strong trunk a strong vascular flow so so uh, bruce i know you're very savvy with uh, mechanization in the vineyard and especially with machine harvesting how do you see this pruning kind of helping with machine pruning i mean not machine harvesting going in the future uh, short shoots weak shoots are definitely in uh, a challenge when it comes to machine harvesting um, Two things, short shoots don't lignify very quickly compared to a strong cane. Um, so immediately it's a little more brittle. Um, so you're trying to remove fruit off of a short shoot that's weak to begin with. You end up with a broken position. Um, the other part of that is machine harvesters will take everything that those bow rods touch. <laughs> so if, if you're looking for fruit uniformity, ripe, ripening, uh, uniformity, then um, you, having 
strong shoots that are all evenly uh, vigorous is, is the key to having high quality fruit. Yeah. So can you all tell me of some other success stories you have had, not in Lake County or in, in the world, or what you've seen that have that motivate you to keep on wanting to do this, or anything out there that's, you know, is a great story that you want to tell? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the best results that I saw, about, I've been working with this company since 2015, and I had the opportunity to work in different wine regions around the world. But the best results that I got wasn't about the plants, but was about the people. Mm -hmm. So one of my best experience was in the 2018, yes, in South Africa, where, uh, I don't know, someone of you never been in South Africa? Oh. Well, the, condition for the, the work conditions for the labels are really bad. But I do remember the first time that I arrived in this winery and there were all these people that never saw a white guy working with them. And I spent with them many, many days, and I do remember that at the last day of work together, they, you know, made me a gift. Yeah, an easy thing, but for them was meaning so much. And uh, that one, I have to see, was the best result that I got in my work. Because at the end, yeah, we speak a lot of about the plans, about this, but what we do in reality, we are not, we work with the people. What we believe is in the training of the people when we do our work. Right. So Absolutely. this is my best result, but I don't know. Well, let me let me briefly oh. chime in as he thinks about it. I mean, that's why we do this in English and Spanish, right? Of we, course. Right. We have as you know the great. There's many great vineyards in the world where, where only the owner touches the vineyard, right? They don't want many people touching the vineyard because it's their baby, right? And in places in Lake County and California where labor, labor's tough. We need to invest in our people being the vineyard labor and try to make sure they're at the top of the game, highly educated. And that's one reason why we're doing this both in English and in Spanish. So, Yeah, we do, we do not have to forget that at the end, they are, as I said before, they are putting the hands on our, they yeah. are handling our, you know, vineyards or yep. your vineyards in this situation. Yep. Jed, any comment? <laughs> no, I definitely agree that uh, uh, the most... Uh, interesting results uh, working with Simonita Cirque uh, is from how the mentality of the people that you work with changes of from being someone who just comes in and, and, and works with the plants uh, to someone who actually thinks about what they're doing and uh, thinks about the, the results of, of the work, right? Right, yeah. I enjoyed that about the class too, is it it brought in, well, I met other growers from around the county that I knew of but had never met, never shook their hands. Um, but there were participants in the class that other companies um, had brought in from out of county. I think we had Valley Counties represented it as well as Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino. So meeting those people and, you know, being able to spend some time in the field with them was valuable. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Uh, this process, I can tell you that we have at Brassfield, uh, I think we sent seven people in the Spanish classes, and they all came back, they understood it, and we kind of broke the team, broke them up in small teams as we're pruning Are certain sure? blocks, right? You know, to teach them that way, because, you know, one guy trying to teach us with 10 people, it was, wasn't going to work well. So we actually had some young vine Cabernet that I kind of, after pretending to understand Italian and watching the YouTube videos, I thought I knew what I was doing. <laughs> so, you know, I took that knowledge the first year and this this year, and so we kind of applied that together, and I think we had a good understanding going in this year, especially with the Cabernet all, that we just really planted. We're going to definitely run that all through there, so I think that's been very great. Yeah, one thing that is really important to understand is a process that takes time. Yeah. Because... Uh, a pruning, the pruning is a question of habits. So change an habit takes time, a lot of time. Uh, maybe I already said this, I'm Italian, I like to drink an espresso every morning. If not, I get really annoyed. <laughs> you know, it's an, an habit. But it takes time to do this. And uh, so for this, 
we are happy that we are able to uh, go ahead with this program with the Lake County for at least another two years, right? Yeah, at I least, know. yeah. 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 So, because uh, at the end we prune just once a year, we harvest once a year, so it's step by step. Well, you get to prune twice a year. You go one side of the yeah. If you, to to the other other right. yeah. if you want yeah. to come with me, if you want to come with me, whenever you want. So I see this book. I don't know if anybody saw it outside. There's actually two uh, two versions of this book for sale out, uh, out there. Yeah. Well, this is the Guyot methodology, and there is also the Cordon methodology because, as we said, we focused so much on the two main training systems that there are around the world. Mm -hmm. But we work with all the kind of training system uh, and are translated in all, well English, Spain, Spanish, French, French, Italian too, German, German. But no one is interested here about German. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I mean we are not selling yet these books here in the United States. We're working to. Oh okay. Yeah, it's a bureaucratic process. Uh, Sorry. Do you want one? I would like one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't. We can speak later. <laughs> yeah, we can speak later. <laughs> I, I'll buy your espresso. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I guess, Tony, I mean, you're the group, you're over here, you're seeing, overseeing the most people in the, in the field right now. Um, how long did it take you to your team to kind of understand it? Was it, it wasn't a one day thing. Obviously, they went to the class. Was it, did it take all winter pruning or how, I mean, just talk me through how that kind of worked. I took five people to the class with me uh -huh. and it, I divided them like you did too out in Brassfield, but it took us two to three good days to get the hang of the new pruning with yeah. my crew out there, yeah. the training. It was something different for everybody that we were doing, but. Yeah, and, and my goal, and I, I know, is if I can, if, as someone who just recently planted a vineyard and how, knows how expensive it is, if I can get a couple extra years out of that, if I go from 30 to 35 or even 30 to 45, that's, that's massive, <laughs> right? So um, I don't imagine things getting cheaper in this world. Um, so everything I can keep in the ground longer productive, it's going to be a win. So, all right. Any more questions from you guys want to say anything? I can just add something. Uh, so apart from, you know, working with the plants and everything, what, what what we're really doing as well is we're create, creating a common language that we can use within a team to know what we're talking about. We have common words for all the things that we do and we can easily, even though we're not the same people, if we all know uh, the same terms and, and, uh, and ideas, we can uh, come along and keep working on the same vineyard just like as if it was ourselves. Year after year. Well, that's Beautiful. why I think I understood the videos in Italian. Was that you're talking about a vine, right? Yeah. I understood the cuts and what you're trying to talk. I, I think I, so. Yeah, right. I had no yeah. idea what you were saying, but I felt like I understood it. So yeah. But maybe because we are Italian, we speak a lot of with our hands. <laughs> 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 that one too. But yeah. yeah, yeah, we are trying to create this language behind the pruning. Yeah. So if in the wine they speak French, in the future in the vineyard they will speak Italian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like. Any more comments from you guys over here about anything? My yeah. only comment is I'm, I look forward to next year. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, Phase yeah. two of it. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I need your guys' help on that. So Blanca, <laughs> are we going to cane print it or cold on print it? <laughs> so. It will. <laughs> took a class after class that I was in now, it was your, your first advanced class that you taught. Oh. And uh, I thought it was great because there was people, there was two people from California, someone from Southern uh, Idaho that flew up, um, someone from Washington, someone from Oregon, and we had a very small group and we got to talk, which is similar to what, you know, what this is all about. And uh, one of the things they said is once you start pruning this way, you, you're going to forget everything you learned and you're, <laughs> you're going to prune this way. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any questions from the crowd out here? Okay. Oh, we do have one. Sorry. So I am not in the grape industry, and I took the class because I just bought a couple of grape plants. And going out in the field and seeing... Um, how do I politely say it? Um, the wrong ways of pruning, 
so to speak. And um, from the winter class that we took on the actual pruning of, I'm gonna get the terms wrong, the, the canes, I guess. Um, I, w I could see what we were doing then, but when it came to springtime and when we started seeing all the new shoots start to grow, everything just came together and you could see that the plants that we worked on were actually already healthier. And you could see why with Jet's training, he was awesome out there. He answered everybody's questions. And I really look forward to an advanced class. And Deborah, are you up there? There you are. Um, <laughs> a suggestion of a class, if they continue to do this, would be um, a lot of vineyards are still um, grading the ground and starting new plants. If we could get a class on how to go from these little teeny plants and then how to train them into the actual grape, uh, sorry, the cordon, I don't know. Training what, a vine? The vineyards. The, 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 vineyards. Yeah. the vineyards. That would be an awesome um, <clears throat> class, I think. Thank you. My name is Nicole Flora. I'm with the Lake County Economic Development Corporation. And my question kind of goes back to what your comment was about um, your investment into the fields and how you might be able to see a longer productive life from the vineyards. Um, about how many of the grape growers in Lake County are taking on this new um, method? And if you were to extrapolate like what your savings are gonna be for the industry and how it might impact you in the long term, you know, what, what are we talking about here? And, and I mean, yeah, is this potentially good news for the industry? Yeah, let me, I can answer broad strokes. <laughs> okay, so uh, the goal of the three years, I would say it'd be great if we can get nearly every grape owner to the class, right? That's a goal, right? If we can touch, you know, majority of, or even 30% of all the field laborers or managers or supervisors, because those are the guys that are actually doing the teaching hands-on, doing all that. So if we teach them and it sticks with them, it's going to eventually trickle through and everybody's going to get touched by it. So our goal is if we want our vineyards to last longer, we'd make some more profitable, more money, and all this other stuff, right? So that's absolutely the reason why we're doing this. Um, I forgot what the other question was, but that's... To quantify it, yeah. You know, what does it look like over the long term for potential future investment in you know, if it goes as, a, as planned, how much money could you potentially save? I mean, clear, I mean, pl playing a vineyard is, is, ex is expensive. I mean, I could, I would say if it's just raw land, uh, without removing, just going in it, it could be as little as, you know, 15 to 25. If you're going all out, clearing land, ripping out another crop and what all this, it could be up to $50,000 an acre. So, I mean, you're talking about if you, or even more than that, I mean, I know Bruce might have if, some if more recent numbers than I do. Look at it over the three years of development before you're in production phase. It can easily touch 45 to 50K yeah. an acre. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you're looking at that, if, I mean, the longer you push that out, the better you are, right? And that's today's prices. And 10 years ago, when I first got here, it was probably a fraction of that. You yeah, know. when we planted our Cabernet, the price of steel trellis material was half what I paid last year. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, a lot. Bill, you this weren't new, in the class. I know, I wasn't yeah, right? in the class. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have my vineyard pruned by, uh, you know, vineyard management. <laughs> have we trained any of the vineyard management to, do, to take a look at this, uh, this um, new, new way? I'm, sh I'm sure some of the vineyard management companies, I know some of the vineyard management companies were involved, but I can't tell you exactly who was there. But yes, I mean, like we said, ideally we, ideally you would come and then you could tell your vineyard man, management company, this is what, you know, we should this do, you what's know. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a gentleman farmer, <laughs> I don't do that. Yeah, I think uh, vineyards that don't have their own management company that fall into the, you know, spectrum, maybe 10 acres, maybe, you know, somewhere around there, you're going to really have to demand it, I think. Um, otherwise, you're kind of, you're at their whim at, at the moment. I'd yeah. like to add something about this. So, uh, our this after this project with the uh, Lake County, we work also with private clients and in the 
you know, in our private clients we have also contractors or being a manager company, as you, as you called, um, but that we work with since many years. So, uh, one of the most unique things that we are doing here in the Lake County that no one else is doing here in uh, California, but also in the United States, even the famous Napa Valley is not doing this, is to give the opportunity to everyone that works in the wine industry to train also their people, their, their guys, their crews, their workers, to at least have an idea of what is a vineyard. Because many times it happens, especially uh, I was speaking with someone before, that there is a lack of labor that is going on. Mm -hmm. oh, we need to bring people from uh, mainly Mexico to, to to get the labels to do our, all our works. And most of the time, these people, they don't even know what is a vineyard. They don't even know what is a vine. So how we can ask to these people to put their hands on our vineyard? We have to because, of course, we need to do the work. I don't want to say that they are, they do not have the training to do that. So what we did here in Lake County is something unique. Because everyone can, also a contractor can bring his crew or his uh, crew leaders to train them, at least to help them to train the other guys that are coming. So the big thing is train the people that after we go to work in the vineyard. And what we are doing here is something unique that we are, I hope we will be able to expand even all around the United States yeah. in the future. Well, I was, uh, you know, you showed a couple of vines in your presentation. One of them, I believe, was that Swiss vineyard that was real small, yeah. unique. You know, I know this, it's too early to ask this because you haven't spent a lot of time in Lake County, but, you know, being a volcanic site that's at high elevation, that has some, you know, s large diurnal changes in temperature, do you foresee a mountain or hillside pruning si uh, style that could be developed over time in Lake County? Or do you think well, the way of the cane pruning and spur pruning is the best way to go in Lake County? I know that's a difficult thing to ask because uh, you have to need more data to be able to answer it properly. It's probably. an interesting question. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So what, of speaking generally, not just maybe about Lake County because of course we just started this year to work here. We do not want to we don't want to pretend to know everything, but what we saw that here in California, speaking generally speaking, and traditionally, the short pruning, so speaking about high train vine and um, cordon, always worked really well. Was the first kind of pruning that was brought here from uh, the Spanish people, and uh, it was also the first vineyard in Lodi or Napa was planted it in that way. The cane is something pretty new, and uh, the cane that you are working with here, that is a quad cane sometimes, mm -hmm. is not really a um, traditional cane as you can have in uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. In Europe, you can have usually you have the plant with two arms, or one arm in the plant, or maybe without, with one or two canes. But what you have here is more a mix between a head train vine and a cane, because the structure of the vine is trunk with these arms, and these canes. So, in our experience, the cane prune vines mm, doesn't work really well, especially with the drought that we had yeah. in the past four years. Uh, but there are a lot of, you know, thoughts about also rootstocks and other things and spacing uh, that are going on right now. So, if we have to say, yeah, short pruning, but I can't say what is better if cordon or yeah of course line. that's fair in in all these pictures you see in uh, specific areas in the world many times they have developed a specific way of pruning their vines that depends on you know the particular climate uh, ex exposure of light uh, the the ease at which you can pick the grapes you know so over time it definitely there can always be a better way to yeah. structure the vines in uh, any specific area. The only way to understand this is should be try different different things. Trials, yeah. 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 What we had, uh, we both come from Europe, well, Jet is born here in California, but what we had in Europe then we didn't have here is that we had a little bit more time to make mistakes. 
<laughs> That's it. No, it's true. I mean, a few uh, thousand years. Yeah. Not, not so, very much. <laughs> but I think that it will be good that also speaking about the varieties that we are growing. Yeah, one thing is, you know, there is Cabernet Sauvignon everywhere. I understand why, because it's one of the well, easy, well, most valued grapes in the world. It's what the market wants. Yeah, right exactly. Now. But also find the var variety that is working better for here and you know make the best out of from that variety. That maybe is not Cabernet Sauvignon or Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc. Maybe is uh, something we don't something know. Something that we don't know. But Chardonnay. continually research. You know what, what what potential does. Yeah, I think that we got out a little bit from the question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Um, Thank you all for coming up and being a part of the panel. Chris from Cat's Paul, uh, Tony from uh, Cash Creek, and Bruce from... Don't even try. Okay. Merrill <laughs> 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 Precision Farming. There you go. There we go. Thank you. And Jacopo <laughs> and Jeff, thank you for everything, and thank we're going to work for you going forward. So thank you all. Thank, thank you, you very all. much. Thank you. Okay. All righty. We'll move on along here to introduce... Uh, uh, Falco for being a sponsor of our um, uh, the pruning school and Grow West was also a sponsor. Both have been wonderfully supportive of uh, this program, and both of them have uh, uh, booths here. Uh, we 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 thought what a better way to wrap our event than showcase exciting new products that Falco is showing. Uh, we welcome Jennifer Tom um, Thompson. California's representative of Felco, uh, the world leader in pruning shears and pruning tools, and she gives us a first look at uh, Felco's new electronic uh, pruning shears. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Jennifer Thompson. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to stay more casual and be down here with you all so that I can um, reach for Felco tools. Um, Thank you for staying late. I know it's running a little bit long, and thank you, of course, to Lake County Wine Grape Commission for including Falco. Um, I am not just the California sales rep. Um, I have a bit of a backstory that I try to relate to people when I'm speaking so that you understand that maybe I'm not just the sales lady for Falco. Uh, my family actually has grown um, uh, trees and vines in California, specifically the southern area of Napa, California, for 85 years. Um, we're celebrating our 85th anniversary this year, and that's quite a feat, as I'm sure many of you all know, um, to still have a family-owned and operated ranch in California anywhere, let alone Napa County. Um, <laughs> so uh, in 2015, Felco came to me and said, Jennifer, you know, we really can't get any traction with these electric pruners. Um, w you're young, uh, you're taking over these ranches. Are you interested in, we're really looking for some science, some data, some feedback, Felco, Two is family owned and operated, um, third generation CEO of Falco Switzerland, uh, still headquartered in Switzerland to this day, family owned and operated. We're looking for someone to give us some data, some feedback, and we Falco truly prides itself on doing the testing and the engineering and the precision work ahead of time before getting tools into people's hands. But we can't find anyone in California wine who will test these tools. And I said, well, I was getting into the business of doing machine harvesting back in 2011, 2012, again, unheard of in Napa, California. Um, and I said, uh, I would stamp my feet to winemakers and say, I want to do technology. I don't want to talk about it. We all go to sessions and we talk about advancement of the industry and what new technologies can create efficiencies, but nobody really does it. Um, and so what ended up happening is they showed up, Felco showed up and they said, Jennifer, we'd like you to, um, test this Felco power tool that we've been making since 1990s. Um, we'd like you to um, track the number of cuts. We'd like you to um, get your crew's feedback. We'd like to talk about the you know, ergonomics of it, how it works in a canopy, uh, cane, or cordon. Um, we'd like to come out and take a marketing video of you. We'd like to do some checks and balances. And I said, sure. By all means, let's do let's do some technology, um, and so uh, I was supplied with six of these um, for our six-man vineyard crew, and guess what? Um, a young woman trying to tell six crew members that we're going to do technology, it didn't go over so well. Um, and so, what I think is super fascinating is that I did I, I ended up 
at some point we all have to be managers, right? Um, you can work alongside, there's different styles of management. You can work alongside of a crew and try to hope that they pick up what you're doing. You can work with Simone Eaton Cirque and Lake County Wine Grape Commission to bring your crew to the education to try and you know, hope that it's gonna rub off on them or spark their interest. Um, for me, I'm a let's do it alongside them because I would never ask my crew to do something that I can't do as well or that I haven't tried to do. Um, you know, our, our crews in California will prune more vines than I will ever prune, Jet will ever prune, uh, Simone Eaton Cirque in, in its entirety. The, this cruise will prune and touch more vines in California than we can ever hope to do. And so how can we make that more efficient for them? How can we reduce uh, carpal tunnel, uh, workplace fatigue? How can we also increase our own efficiencies as landowners and, and managers? And so at the end of this uh, very painful season of, of literally forcing my crew to use these, uh, we discovered that really you can, you can achieve 20% more cuts per day. Um, so you're creating efficiencies in the 20 to 30% range, and this is in 2015. So I stay in touch with Falco, um, you know, hey, how's it going? They're a sponsor. Um, it comes along, and I'm very, very proud to say that I was the first in my family in four generations to only focus on running a commercial vineyard. It's 100 acres at four different sites, and I was very proud that I didn't need a second job. <laughs> and then um, I realized I need a second job. <laughs> and so I have successfully re planted and trained vines, uh, you know, 50 to 70 of our 100 acres in the past 10 years, and I've done it in cash. I have no loans. I come from an old farming family. And so it's nice to have a side job with Felco, but it is something that I truly believe in. And I think it's so interesting as I'm, as I'm listening today, like I, I started this in 2015 and 2016, and I see the efficiencies that can be created but yet I'm still introducing this to people as if it's a brand new thing. Um, and what my experience has shown working now for Falco across the globe is that it is not uncommon to go to pruning competitions or, and I use pruning competitions just as a benchmark for a global industry. Um, everyone shows up with one of these. They don't show up with a manual shear. A manual shear, again, enhances carpal tunnel. It, it, it brings up your workman's comp cost. And, you know, you can cut your hand on anything. Um, but, uh, you know, the California industry, specifically our regions, uh, Solano, Lake, uh, Napa, Sonoma, are still kind of hesitant on this. And so we had this theme at the end of the panel here about, you know, it's the elephant in the room. There's no more labor coming across the border. <laughs> um, and so if you can put a tool in your crew's hand, which is lightweight, ergonomic, it's uh, designed, manufactured, Swiss-German steel from within 30 miles of our factory in Neuchâtel, Switzerland, to this day. Um, you know, our family, what I can tell you, has had these now for eight years in our barn. You service them, you take care of them, you lubricate them, um, and you teach your guys about how to use them. They will become, now I have my crew coming to me saying, Jennifer, you're never gonna believe what we've been doing with them. We've been clearing the creek out with them. We've been uh, f forming the olive trees. We've, we're using them not only during the pruning season, but we're using them for landscaping. And so this is called the Felcotronic. This is the uh, most powerful motor on the market. This is the longest uh, running manufactured power tool in the market. And not a lot of people know that we make these. Um, and so uh, I, it is completely machined here in the handpiece of aluminum, uh, Felco grade aluminum, which is aircraft aluminum, proprietary blend of metals. Um, the carbon steel is uh, designed and a proprietary blend that will actually um, stand up to um, working conditions in an agricultural market three times longer than the competitor. So what does that mean? That means you, you as, a, as a landowner, have to replace the blade, you have to replace someone else's blade three times more than you have to replace a Felco. What does that do? That creates cost savings. It creates ways for you to become more efficient. It produces more income in the bottom line at the end of the year. Um, and so this comes in three different hand sizes. I did hear a gentleman here, he told me, oh, they're really heavy. This is about four and a half pounds of a battery that will last eight and a half to 10 hours in a day. 
one full working day, a lithium ion battery. So between your crew lunches and breaks and things like that, you're gonna get a full work day out of it. Um, three years manufacturer warranty, fourth year if you actually uh, go ahead and service it, which I, as I took over an old family ranch, I came into a place where you had to charge the battery on the tractor every single day. Well, I implemented a maintenance program. I implemented a safety program. These truly can create an efficiency in your workplace or allow you, perhaps if you adopt my, or have a similar management uh, technique, which is it helps for your crew to, to see you doing that with them, or for them, for take what you've learned in the Simonite method and see you implementing that you can keep up with a professional pruning crew with one of these. Um, and so, uh, we have three hand sizes. One will do a, a one inch size, one and a half inch size, or a two inch size. Now, I don't have the two inch with me, but I would share with you guys, if you're, if you're done, before you're going to get a glass of wine, come over here and look at my little spinner. Um, the two inch, as we're looking for efficiencies, you know, I got into this between 2009 and 2011, and my dad said, you picked the worst time to get into farming. Um, I feel very fortunate, it has been a hell of a 10 years, um, however, um, I feel very fortunate to have been uh, introduced to my apprenticeship years, as I call them, between 2009 and 2011, because um, you had to be scrappy, you had to figure out how you were gonna sell fruit, you had to be able to create some more efficiencies, and, and, and so, I now see people coming to me, my peers, saying, Jen, can I have the two inch? I'll take the two inch demo out of your barn. And I have about three to four of them in my barn. And uh, I go, what are you gonna do with them? And they go, we're gonna cut off an old Chardonnay vineyard and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna top work it over to Sauvignon Blanc. And so they're now taking the two inch Velcotronic and they're using it for conversion methods. Um, and so again, it's kind of that ethos of, um, you know, we, we've come full circle today. We've seen the Turrentine, we've seen the, the wheel. We've seen, you know, we know kind of where we are on this economic precipice. We've got Simonite saying, you know, make sure that you're teaching your crew and learning with your crew. And then Felco comes in with a solution that can actually, again, create some efficiencies for you and allow you to manage your, your vineyards a little bit more efficiently. Um, what I promised today was to show this unit. And this is brand new, and I have to apologize, I'm not even, the Swiss CEO carried this, hand carried this to me, to California, two weeks ago, and said, Jennifer, here it is. So, Lake County Wine Grape Commission was, was pleasant enough to know, hey Jennifer, will you show us the Falcotronic, which is professional grade tool that comes with the backing of, of a Swiss, fully made components that's gonna, you know, just like your Felco hand pruner, last you a lifetime. And that is still the ethos of Felco. We want to provide tools to agricultural marketplace that are going to last a lifetime. We're tired of seeing the trash that's thrown in the fields. We're tired of seeing, you know, steel that is being sourced from other various countries, not the most quality when we're growing quality wine grapes here. But this, you know, has the battery with the, with the cord, it has the machined hand, and a lot of people have been asking us for, can you just make like a drill style? And so this is a sister company with Felco, out of the, it is Swiss designed, Swiss uh, assembled, and this is a Swiss German steel blade from Neuchâtel, Switzerland. Um, so you'll see that it's branded on the, on the tool, up on the blade, Felco, but these are parts and components that we are sourcing from our valued partners and actually assembling though at the Swiss Felco factory. Um, and so you'll come with three different batteries. Um, three batteries will get you through 14 days, four, sorry, 14 hours worth of work, 14 days. We hope we're not out there that much. Um, 14 hours worth of work, three batteries. Um, it has a double close uh, and it will open it and close double. So there it is in the open position. If you're coming along and you're doing like some larger wood or you're making a larger cut, um, you're doing a conversion and then it'll, and then forgive me because it's backwards. There it is. It's backwards to the professional unit over here. And I don't want to say that this isn't professional. I wanted to show this to you guys because I think that Lake County 
has demonstrated through your work with even Simeon Oit and Cirque that you're open to new ideas. I'm telling you from Napa that they don't want to do any new ideas down there. You guys are at least willing to try some new ideas. Um, if you were to put some of units like this in your crew's hands, I truly believe you can make some differences in your bottom line. You can also reduce carpal tunnel, workplace fatigue, and maybe you know you become a leader in another way you start using the electric tools that are already being used worldwide that people are showing up to pruning contests with while california is still in the dark ages with manual hand tools you try to do uh you know 30,000 cuts a day uh that's that's a lot but with this type of a tool you really do um gain a little bit more efficiencies in your vineyards and um so Welcome to the wild horn. The Alpen wild horn is what this is called. We'll hope to work with um, Deborah and Megan to hopefully um, send an email to you all. We're, pro we're projecting in around June or July um, in order to let you know that there will be, we'll be taking a limited number of pre-sales on these units. Um, and I do have um, with me today some 15% um, off Felco cards, there's a code that we've created just for you guys. If you go to felco.com, um, you can purchase the original uh, unit that I showed you um, with about a $300 discount, which makes this a $1,600 investment. Now again, the manufacturer's warranty is three to four years, but I'm telling you that our family still uses ours and my guys come to me every day and are like, guess what we used it for today. Um, so uh, speaking grape grower to grape grower, if I were to, you know, you have a 10, you have a 20 acre vineyard or larger, I would still select this. But if you're looking for something that's cost effective um, and you are interested in this unit, please come and see me afterwards. You guys can, I bring this stuff because oftentimes, as someone mentioned to me earlier today, I know Felco's the good stuff because it's always locked behind the case. Um, part of my job as the California rep is like, I'm, I'm a grape grower, you can level with me, you can ask me, you know, I'm gonna tell you the truth about things, but also you can touch, feel, see things that retailers don't wanna necessarily have on their shelf because they don't wanna have carrying costs, right? Everybody's trying to save. Um, and so please do come and see me, you're welcome to touch this, feel it, tell me whether it's too heavy, give you feedback, um, give me feedback. And you know, when I took this job three years ago, it was Jennifer, can you just do research and development in the marketplace? And they would send me all the brand new tools off the line from Switzerland. And so I was the one to test these loppers. Um, <coughs> I took these across California, up and down the state, said run over them, break them, give them to the most abusive crew you could possibly find, um, and I did that, and then I worked directly with the engineers to make adjustments to the geometry, cutting head, lightweight, um, and also materials that the tool is actually constructed from. And, um, you know, I really believe in the product. It's built for a lifetime, um, and, and my, my representation of the brand is not just on the fact that I work for Felco, but I too am a business owner. I own 100 acres of land, and I've got to find 20% more efficiencies somewhere because this inflation is killing me. Um, and so, thanks for listening to my spiel about Felco. If you have any questions, you want to touch, talk, see any of this stuff, I welcome you guys to do so. Question? Sure. Okay, so replacement blades, replacement parts, you can see any of our valued retailers, which would be Vineyard Industry Products, Grow West, uh, Rainbow Ag in this area. Um, and if they don't carry the part right there, they can stock it, they can get it. Um, it's a next day turnaround. Or with this little card right here, you can go to felco.com, put in your replacement parts, and we pack and ship the next day. Um, this unit, how much would you pay for this unit? You, you put it in your hand. I'm doing the research and development. <laughs> yeah, so I do still the sell, yes, still sell the manual ones, and you know, while they're deciding how much um, they are going to pay for that, I did want to point out just two quick other items because they caught it out of the corner of my eye. But Deborah is telling me to wrap up. Another efficiency in the vineyard that we've all started to embrace, and I love this, is have you noticed how many more ladies are working in the vineyards? A lot more ladies out there. So it's really super important that if you're using a manual hand shear, or you see your crews that you're purchasing hand shears for, that you, uh, you pick the right size for their hand. 
This right here is my personal pruner. I prune with my own crew. You're looking at it like, uh, is it really that small? Look how small our hand is. This is called the Felco 15, and it is the first and only tool in the professional marketplace that has been crafted and designed, built for small hands. Now, if you put a much larger tool in my hand, I don't have the hand strength to be able to open up wide and make the depressive cut on the vine, but with something that actually fits my hand, I'm gonna be able to keep up with my crew. I'm also gonna have less fatigue, and this has truly been ergonomically crafted for a small-handed person. So this is just my personal plug for, if you have ladies working on your crew or you see them, like please outfit them with a Felco 15. Please do not be putting a Felco 8 or 7 in their hands, let alone a 2 in their hands. Those are for large hands. It's just too much wear and tear on your, on your wrist and whatnot. Okay, did you decide how much you're gonna spend on this for me? This will have an introductory price of $500 or less. Oh, you like that price? Yes. <laughs> So it comes with three batteries, it comes with a holster, it comes with everything that you see in this case. So I would invite you, if you're truly interested by this incredible deal, come and see what's in the case. Um, it has a little adjustment key, it comes with the charger. It's not a la carte. It comes all together in this case for less than $500. And with Deborah and Megan's help, we're gonna send you out like a pre-order form and try to drop that price a little bit lower for y'all. Any other questions? Thank you so much for listening and keep up the good work up here in Lake County. Thank you, Jennifer. Sorry to kind of push you through that, but uh, if we're going to wrap this up, please feel free to stay for some wine and just a little social time and check out all of our uh, vendors out here, Falco, Grow West, and everybody else, American Ad Credit. They do still have that auction. All you got to do is a QR code to do that. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for coming to this year's Momentum. Um, and sorry we ran a little bit long, but uh, thank you again.